Hi, this is Asitosh. I can hear you. Perfect. Uh, this is Katarina. Uh, I just posted the link that you uh, shared on the email. So, yeah, it works. It's perfect. Thank Good. you. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Mm, we'll start in around eight minutes. So, yeah, that's yeah, fine. A few minutes. I'll share in the meantime on Twitter mm. that we are starting. <laughs> You really are very well organized. You have Twitter and all this good stuff. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't use any of that stuff at all. <laughs> Wrong generation, um, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if you, you don't really, I don't know if you really need it or not. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it may have benefits. I mean, you know, our science, I think in a sense it stays a lot within the community. And so, you know, what is happening in particle physics or this or that outside of our own community, I'm not sure how much it gets out, how much people find out what are we doing, why are we doing it, what are our ideas, what are we pursuing, what are the mysteries left to solve, why are they interesting. I don't know if this ever gets out outside of the scientific or particle physics community. So it may be that if we did a little more of the Twitter and the kind of stuff you're doing, it may actually help just to inform people. It's not like we're trying to get any message out. It's just people may find some of these things fun, but they never find out because we don't do anything like social media or Twitter. So. It's, uh, it's in the end our fault, right? People don't know what we are up to because <laughs> we don't do anything to tell them. Yeah, I hope it will, you know, it will, it's just adding some more information maybe <laughs> to, to uh, social media, you know, different type of information. Yep. Hopefully so <laughs> that's the hope. And uh, yeah, meet Frank. Frank, nice that you're here. Nice seeing you here. Meet uh, Dr. Ashtush. Um, oh, let me say if I na say your name right. Ashtush <laughs> Don't worry. Kotwal? Is that good? Ashtush Kotwal. Kotwal. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah, meet. Hi, Dr. Uh, Kotwal. Uh, thanks uh, hi, for uh, gracing, uh, you know, share, uh, co co coming to share with us. Um, Absolutely. No society. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah. this news is very big. I, I'm probably is not the general, like a typical, uh, you know, uh, 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 citizen of, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of physics. So that's, uh, I read, I listen to podcasts like physical world, chemistry world, and, uh, read magazines a lot. So apparently what well, well, your group has uh, contributed is uh, had a shock, send a shock wave. Uh, shock through wave. Wow. Yeah. That's even more strong a word than I would have thought. <laughs> shock wave. <Okay. laughs> I, I, I'm just uh, very much curious of uh, what, you know, that's why I, I, you know, I really look forward to this event uh, by yeah. uh, Katarina and uh, Serena and others. Okay, that's great. Hi, Serena. How are you? Uh, Hello. Nice that you're here. Uh, meet Dr. Ashutosh uh, Kotswab. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. This will be a very interesting talk. I have a chemistry background, but I've always kept a, kept a keen eye on various developments in physics, and this was a biggie. Ah, interesting. Okay. You know, in middle school, I liked chemistry more than physics. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, somehow that turned, huh? <laughs> well, it, it's, I wouldn't call it a turning. It sort of became, yeah, maybe in high school, 10th grade chemistry, you know, 10th, 11th grade chemistry started to become like atomic. Oh, there is a way to understand how the electron goes around the atom. And this is the reason the molecules become molecules and atoms start sticking together, electrons jump around. So by then the chemistry had become 
like a physics explanation of the chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. So then it started occurring to me, oh, it sounds like when you get down to it, somewhere down there, chemistry is physics. And well, it's, it's very true. And, you know, you sort of have to pick a, a length and time scale in nature because you just can't cover them all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so at some point I started getting interested in like how do semiconductors work and how do lasers work? And so I went into engineering. But mm -hmm. then the coursework there said, ah, okay, the way you understand semiconductor and laser is, oh, the atoms are doing this and the atom, silicon atoms are doing that and the laser atoms are... So everything was being explained in some physics language. So, so I said, ah, if I do physics, then I'll be able to follow a little bit of everything else. See, my trap was I was enamored by the complexity of organic structure uh -huh. and reaction mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. And so to, you know, to get through that, you got to push electrons and develop some kind of, you know, model of what's going on there. And, how yes. and um, you know, it made some really nice movies in my head. So I, I just sort of, you know, kind of moved in and got comfortable there. Really good. I think that's uh, uh, a constant uh, theme uh, of science. I, I'm actually curious of, uh, since it has as a rare opportunity. Uh, Dr. Kwan, uh, what, what's your uh, comment on this uh, line of uh, reasoning that uh, physics being uh, uh, the methodology, at least, is trying to reduce to a simpler uh, model uh, that we can carry out experiments and uh, uh, theory and uh, verification. However, on the uh, uh, going up the, the level of complexity, seems a lot of uh, uh, things cannot be yet be explained. What what uh, what what you know, you are just just out of curiosity. You're exactly right. There are people who say that many of the successes of the previous century are from the first thing you said, the reductionist approach, which is if you keep pursuing the logic, which is sort of like particle physics, everything is made up of something. If you want to understand how the system works, go figure out how the individual parts work and then you'll see how the system works. So that has worked quite a bit. So to a large extent, many of the things we do understand from the bottom up approach, which is the way you described it, the reductionist approach. It's working to a large extent, but as you exactly pointed out, it hasn't explained many things, you know, how, how life evolves or certain extremely complex mechanisms. So there are people even in the physics community and certainly outside who are actually saying that this century is now about complexity. So in a sense, even the job of physics is no longer simply understanding the basic rules and then saying, ah, oh, well, if you know the basic rules, then somehow the small systems evolve into big systems and it all works out. Well, you know, that's not good enough. That there is a field of emergent phenomena, what we call emergent phenomena, which is even though the small elementary things that you put in even though you understand the rules down there, when the system becomes very large, there are new rules that emerge on a scale of complexity that you didn't anticipate. So that has happened even in physics and we've gotten some great insights out of that. And there's a field of physics called renormalization, which is a Nobel prize winning thing, which has helped quite a bit sort of address complexity in a, fundamental way, but I think we're just scratching the surface of complexity. So this century, many people are saying this, that the big advances will come this century, not necessarily from the reductionist approach from, but from sort of handling complexity in a systematic way. What are the emergent phenomena that show up because of complexity, which you couldn't anticipate just because you know the building blocks doesn't mean you understand the whole thing. So you're exactly right. I, I uh, so let's, I'm optimistic we'll, 
that we'll tackle complexity in the same systematic way that we've tackled the building blocks. So let's see how it goes. Wow, thanks. That's the, the best insight I have. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a lot to, to, to digest there. Thank you. Yeah. Complexity is a, is a has is the deep sort of how you address complexity isn't as well developed in a mathematical sense as how you handle the reductionist approach. Historically, all the development started on the reductionist approach, but now we've reached the point we have to deal with complexity. So a whole bunch of very smart people are thinking about it. Somebody will figure something out. Thank you for that very interesting pre-discussion. <laughs> that, <was really, laughs> that was interesting to listen to. Um, yeah, I think we can we can now start and uh, welcome everyone to the Science Society and uh, a special uh, welcome uh, to you, uh, Dr. Ashutosh uh, Kotwal. And before we'll start, um, let me give the audience um, some information about you so they get to know you a little bit better. Um, um, Ashutosh uh, Kotwal um, is um, a particle physicist um, in the US of uh, Indian origin. And he is the Fritz London Professor of Physics at Duke University. And his research is um, in particle physics related to W bosons and the Higgs bosons. And he is also searching for new particles and forces. Uh, he was born in Mumbai, India. And uh, then he began, um, he, he went to school in Calcutta, um, Lucknow and New Delhi and Mumbai. And uh, then he uh, went uh, abroad studying at the University of Pennsylvania on a full scholarship from the university. And he graduated summa cum laude with, with two degrees, electrical engineering and also um, from the Moore School and in economics uh, with finance major from the Wharton School. And he then received a Benjamin Franklin um, scholarship at Penn. Uh, and uh, he received then, his, then he went ahead and did his PhD in physics at Harvard University. Um, he then did a postdoctoral research at Columbia University and later on, he joined Duke University as a professor in 1999, um, where he is now. And he um, won many different awards and he was elected the Fellow of the American Physical Society and Fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science for performing high precision measurements that helped deduce the mass of the Higgs boson. And uh, Dr. Cotwell, he is the recipient of the Outstanding uh, Junior Investigator Award from the U.S. Department of Energy and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship. Um, and um, he's also a fellow of the Maharaja Academy of Science in India. So we are very honored to um, have you here and before we start, we usually ask a couple of uh, interview questions. Uh, Serena, do you want to, to go ahead? Thank you. Sure. sure. Well, welcome. You have um, you know, such, such an accomplished background. I want to give uh, you know, a, the audience a feel for uh, more on a personal level. When you think back earlier in your life, uh, was there a particular moment in time where you really, uh, you, it just really crystallized in your in your mind that you know you want to get into science? Moment uh, could be in your I, childhood, or yeah. Was, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I think that I think my choice goes back so early I can't even remember when <laughs> exactly it started. But you know, my earliest memories. I'm thinking four or five, asking my father some questions, how this works, how that works. Uh, you know, 
you you stand in front of the door you see an electric bell you push it i remember asking how does an electric bell work he said uh, like this like this i don't understand most of it but then my grandfather had sent me some magazines they were called knowledge it was like 20 pages and huge stack of them i have now so i would be flipping through these magazines and basically only reading the science articles uh, i can remember mm-hmm. that from the end of 6 maybe so i can remember all these things right in math questions you know you, you go to high school eventually you uh, you know seventh seven year old you start learning about log i couldn't understand what a log was so okay you got to exponentiate a number so i i sort of remember i couldn't understand most of it but i kept asking and he would give me some answer once i remember asking him how an electric motor works and he sort of described it and i didn't really follow much of it anyway but every time i didn't follow it i remember saying well i got to go read <laughs> so i i mean people to be honest would often think of me as one dimensional i kind of knew that i knew people thought of me as one dimensional because that's mostly what i was doing i was thinking about math and science i would read lots of other books right stories book kids book you know investigator detective books and all these things but my conversation was mostly about these kind of things so i know remember my mother was a little worried you know doesn't he like like other things doesn't he think about other things i think eventually she found out i did i just didn't like to talk about other things as much as i like <laughs> to talk about science so eventually her worries went away but i remember sort of her saying oh why don't you read this literature you know why don't you read this some shakespeare thing i said oh, yeah yeah i've read it but i don't really feel like talking about it so but that's she, interesting she, so you just was, she had a big arts background so she was trying to make sure i was a bit you know mm-hmm. rounded and stuff and i think i was but i just wouldn't like to show it and especially you know how it is right if your mother gets after you about something <laughs> you you probably sort of react the other way right it's uh, uh, well so it's interesting that so it it's as though you you just always knew there was such a clear passion that that's just yeah, always captivated your interest i think so i think it was like a curiosity about it which just stayed all along mhm well so so let's so if we if we jump forward could you give us a a better picture of the path that you took that brings us to brings you here today in the in the research that you'll tell us about ah okay so long you know you heard katrina's description sort of a long tortuous path a uh, lot of coincidences along the way as usual um so at some point when i decided at the last year of grad uh, of undergrad that i wanted to switch to physics because i started getting the feeling through my undergrad research and my professors really encouraged me they said you are sufficiently curious if you understand physics you'll, you'll enjoy things more you'll enjoy other things more so i said fine then i said what kind of physics they said well there is one field of physics which is about the basic building blocks so you might like that that's particle physics okay that's how i ended up there but eventually i started learning about particle physics that you know over time the rules have become very solid you know the quantum mechanics rules are so solid the special relativity rules are so solid if you combine them into what we are going to talk about today quantum field theory it's a very solid set of rules and all the discoveries have put in all the little building blocks into that set of rules so this picture called the standard model of particle physics has evolved so strongly there are some things it doesn't explain at all but the things that it does explain it explains extremely well so you have this sense that you understood some things at such a deep level and yet there are some things that don't fit at all so like what's wrong here right you get this feeling so then i was in grad school i was looking for things to do which could really probe the standard model in other words if there was something new going on that the standard model did in, did not incorporate how would you find out about it what would tell you something new what would give you a glimpse of what's beyond 
uh, you know, a very precise probe in the language of science. And I was asking around and people said, you know, there are some things you can measure very, very precisely. And there's not that many of them and whatever there are are difficult, but there is a very clear calculation in the standard model of that quantity. If you get that answer, the rules are right. If you don't get that answer, the rules are wrong. And so, you know, earlier Frank was saying the shock has been created. So not that I was chasing it, but I had gotten enough feedback from people that there are a few quantities where you get an exact answer from calculation A versus calculation B. And if you get an answer that agrees with A, fine. If you get an answer that agrees with B, then there's something new going on and you found it. And there are not that many things that are so clean cut and clear cut that differentiate between your options. It's like hypothesis testing. So I latched onto this one. The W boson mass is a very clear hypothesis testing uh, number. So I said, well, well, if it's that great, then how come people aren't doing it? Well, say, ah, obviously, right? It is that great, but it's very difficult to do. So of course, somebody like me says, ah, if it's difficult, then, then that's for me. I'm going to take up the challenge. So that's the story. So for 27 years, I'm doing this. It's become more and more precise every five or six years. So this is my fifth time around. And every time it becomes like a factor of two or three more accurate. And it was looking like, yeah, this thing is trending to be something different from the standard model value. So let's keep doing it better. Let's see if it eventually does become significantly different. And it has. So here we are. <laughs> well, thank you for that wonderful background. And at this point, um, the audience can follow along with the PowerPoint that's posted at the top of the room. And uh, you can um, allow, uh, you can deliver the, the talk that you uh, want to present and we can have a Q&A after. Sounds good. Or, huh? or you can let uh, questions guide how you want to deliver. It's up to you, but um, the moderators on stage to help uh, run, there'll be questions and chat in the, in the chat and we can handle that. And so okay. with that, the mic so, is yours, and let's enjoy your talk. Thank you so much, and a wonderful opportunity. I mean, you, as you all know, right, if you get a professor talking about their field of research, you can't get them to stop talking. So <laughs> <laughs> that won't be a problem. So as far as the questions, maybe we can do it this way. If there's like a quick clarification on a slide uh, where my point is somehow not clear enough, but it would help somebody to get along, uh, follow along better. Then for a quick clarification, it's best if I answer right away. But if it's something detailed, and I think the answer is going to follow in more detail in subsequent slides or a conversation that follows, then maybe I can just answer that way, that if you just wait a few more slides, then maybe that will become clearer. So I think we should encourage people to chip in and we'll sort of play it by ear. Either we postpone the question to the end, or I cannot give a quick answer right there and there. And that'll work fine. So the mic is yours. Okay, very good. Thanks so much. So let's go to slide one. Uh, you know, you've seen this paper. It came on the cover of Science. So I always want to make this disclosure that the picture shown there is not a picture that I could have ever made, and my me and my colleagues couldn't even have thought of it. <laughs> Uh, we presented when they asked, would you like to be on the cover? I said, of course, you know, who doesn't like that? So we've made our choice. We're going to put you on the cover. So the editor came on Zoom and said, now please give us a very nice visual of your research. And we started giving them all kinds of plots and technical things and event displays of our detector and everything else and how the data looks. And they said, yeah, this is all wonderful, but you know, people in your community would follow, but the general audience of science won't connect with it. So we said, then we are out of ideas. So I said, don't worry. We'll get to our own graphics designers and we'll come up with something that will catch the imagination of the audience out there. I said, okay, please go ahead. 
you know your business best. And so this is what they came up with, which is this heavy W concrete like thing smashing through a plate at the bottom. And the disc at the bottom has all the standard model framework sort of etched on it. And this is their depiction of this, this W boson, which is heavier than expected. Expected means there was a calculated number and this number came out bigger than the calculation. So that's why it suggests something new is going on. And so it's breaking the rules that were etched on the plate below. That's their upset to the standard model is how the synopsis went. So we were rather happy to see that. Okay, let's go to slide two. So I'm going to give a very brief description of what particle physics is. It's, it's triggered by Frank's question of the, the reductionist approach that this field takes. So this idea, you know, is, is going back a long time. Everything is made up of something. And if you keep going smaller and smaller, it's made of some smaller and smaller things. So at some point, people from chemistry actually figured out the basic building block of substances or molecules. And they were made up of a fixed ratio of atoms. So, you know, some atom like things were combining to become molecules. And at some time, you know, the electrical experiments came along and positive and negative charges were figured out. So this was the state of affairs until about 1911. Many other things were going on. But Rutherford at Manchester, his students uh, under his guidance were doing this amazing experiment. And I don't think they knew what impact it would have. They had discovered radiation by then. So there were these things called alpha particles uh, getting spit off some radioactive element. Now we know the alpha particles are the nuclei of helium. And they were putting this stuff through a thin gold foil. And they expected all the alpha particles to go right through the stuff. But every once in a while, uh, an alpha particle would bounce back at a very large angle. So if you go to slide three, you see a schematic of their setup they had this fluorescent screen surrounding the gold foil and it was a dark room. So whenever an alpha particle hits the fluorescent screen, it would emit a little bit of light and they could see that in the dark room. So almost all of the alpha particles went straight through, but every once in a while they would see a very large angle scatter. So the alpha particles coming almost right back uh, at a very large angle. So this was totally unexpected. So if you go to slide four, you see why it was so unexpected. On the left-hand side was the so-called plum pudding or Thomson model of the atom. So because the new stuff was made of positive and negative charges and typically stuff was electrically neutral, so there had to be an equal amount of positive and negative. So how do you combine the positive and negative together in the atom? That was the original Thomson model on the left side, which is like a plum pudding. The positive and negatives are all mixed together in some kind of pudding and it was all equally distributed everywhere um, and so things were neutral and that's how they were mixed. So now if you throw a projectile through this uh, plum pudding, then the electrical force on the charged particle from the positives and the negatives on average would just cancel out and the positives would repel and the negatives would attract. But since everything was mixed together, on average there wouldn't be any strong force so the alphas would go right through, which is the left-hand side picture. Now, how do you get something to bounce back at such a large angle? And you knew the rules of energy and momentum conservation. And that had to mean that the Planck pudding model doesn't work at all. It means there is a very heavy core to the atom. And that core is like a brick wall. So the alpha is bouncing off a brick wall. And that's the only way it can bounce back at such a large angle. And that immediately completely changed all, you know, a whole bunch of rules. The first was, how do you get so much charge concentrated in a small core? Because they knew like, like sign charge would repel. So if you get all that charge concentrated in a small volume, how can it possibly stay that way? It must repel itself and fly apart. And somehow it was not. That immediately said there had to be at least one other force in nature, which was even stronger than the electric force. And so that strong force was more binding, more sticking together than the repulsion of the electric force. So this was the origin of the strong force inside the nucleus. Another big puzzle, okay, fine. So the nucleus sticks together because of a new strong force. The electrons must then be hovering around the charged nucleus. Well, they would attract the, the charged nucleus by electric attraction. So they would fall into the nucleus. Then the atom won't exist. 
Well, somebody said, but that's okay. You can revolve around like the solar system. And then by Newton's laws, you can stick at a you know particular distance. So that gives the atom a particular volume. Well, that wasn't working either because by then they had the theory of electricity and magnetism. And they knew that when charges go around a circle, they would accelerate. Accelerating charges emit radio waves and that would reduce the energy of the electrons. So they would spiral in as they radiated away their energy from radiation. And eventually they would land into the nucleus and the atom would disappear again. And this wasn't happening. The atom was clearly stable, uh, standing there uh, forever. So that induced the, the theory that, you know, the Newton's laws was not the right way to think of what's happening in the atom. We needed a completely new paradigm. And that was the one of the big things that helped uh, spur quantum mechanics along. So that was the origin of quantum mechanics in some sense. There were many other things going on, but this was a big upset to the original Newtonian mechanics and sort of brought quantum mechanics in. So big, big, big time experiment, uh, you know, big revelation. Two students and a professor figure this out in a dark room. So now let's go to slide five. One of the things that quantum mechanics does, it explains everything in terms of waves. And if you look at the math of waves, you can immediately realize that the position of a wave is not well defined. If you try to define the energy of a wave very carefully, then the wave becomes delocalized. It's all over the place. So its position is not defined. So there is this uncertainty relationship that comes out of quantum mechanics, which is basically relying on the wave picture. So this is saying that if you want to probe smaller and smaller distances and figure out the structure at small distances, you have to go to higher energy. So this is how particle physics started from understanding through you know, throwing projectiles at something and saying, how do things scatter out? You can understand what's inside that object. If you want to probe an atom, you need a certain amount of energy in the beam. If you want to probe the nucleus, you won't need more energy in the beam. And that's how we kept getting smaller and smaller distance physics understood because we kept making beams of higher and higher energy. So accelerators have everything to do with particle physics. The higher the accelerator energy you can make, the smaller the distance you can probe inside and see sort of what's in there. So at some point there were experiments at SLAC in the 1970s at Stanford that the proton and the neutron were also not really fundamental particles, that there were these things called quarks and gluons in there. Okay. Let's go to slide uh, six. So here's three people, Pauli, Heisenberg, Fermi, some of the originators of the math here, and also Fermi also did a lot of great experiments. If you go to slide seven, it depicts a picture of a beam coming along of electrons. It's throwing off some radiation, which is electromagnetic radiation. So that black line is the wave depicting the photon, the quantum of electricity and magnetism. And because it's a very high energy photon, it's got a very high frequency. And so it can probe very small distances and it's propagating deep inside the proton and seeing the little quarks inside the proton. So that's called deep inelastic scattering. So let's go to slide eight. Uh, you see just how much quantum mechanics has done for us. Big part of the economy is now quantum. Slide nine, you see a bunch of pictures just showing you, you know, among other things, electronics, nuclear power, everything about the atom, chemistry, molecules, uh, molecule design, all being done with sort of deep understanding of quantum. So at the same time, if you go to slide 10, the other thing that was happening was special relativity and eventually general relativity from Einstein. That was a theory of space and time all combined together as, as one thing, not space and time separately, but one four dimensional framework. So for now we'll stick with special relativity. So something really amazing happened when the theory of quantum mechanics and special relativity were combined. So this became eventually what we call now quantum field theory, which obeys the rule of quantum mechanics, also obeys the rules of special relativity and obeys the rules of some other mathematical uh, axioms, uh, symmetry properties and all of that. So let's talk about the particular combination here of quantum mechanics and special relativity. And this was triggered by some brilliant work by one of the people in this picture. So if you go to the next slide, which is 11, you see a photograph taken at a conference. Uh, I think this used to be called the Solvay conferences, uh, somewhere around 1919, I think. 
if you count the number of people and how many Nobel Prizes were eventually awarded to this group of people here, there are 19 people who either had or will have the Nobel Prize soon enough in this photograph. So you can see Marie Curie, you can see Schrodinger, Einstein right in the middle, uh, Heisenberg and Pauli at the back there and many other uh, originators of, of 20th century physics. Uh, to the left and behind Einstein is Dirac, a very shy person. Uh, so if you click on the next slide, you'll see the circle around him. So this is what he did. He was one of the original instigators of an effort to combine special relativity with quantum mechanics. So if you go to slide 14, one of the most amazing things he did was out of this work came the theory of matter. So what is matter? So he started describing how an electron itself would behave like a wave and what, how to visualize an electron. If you were to rotate an electron, what would happen? So it, it, the way his description works out, an electron itself appears to be a, like a little bar magnet. So you say, you know, what's the strength of the bar magnet? How strong a magnetic field does it make? And it turns out his theory tells you that the smallest little bar magnet you could ever make is exactly how an electron is. It's the smallest unit of a spinning object and therefore creating a magnetic field around itself and therefore a little bar magnet. The smallest you could ever imagine mathematically is exactly how an electron behaves. So it's the theory of matter comes out of this depiction that he created. So one of the amazing things about the smallest bar magnet is a very unusual property that if you rotate one of these electron objects by 360 degrees, typically you expect everything comes back to itself when you rotate by 360 degrees. That's our usual experience. But this thing doesn't come back to itself. It comes back to the negative of itself. So you already puzzled, you know, wh how, what does it mean for an object to become the negative of itself? <laughs> An object is a positive thing, it comes back to where it was. What does it mean minus? For a wave, that's not something odd. So as soon as you go to the wave picture of everything, you say, oh, that's actually fine. So that's shown on slide 15. Uh, that's right, slide 15, next slide. Which is for a wave to become negative of itself is no big deal. Every time a wave shifts by 360 degrees or one wavelength, it comes back to how it was. But if it shifts by 180 degrees or half a wavelength, then it's flipped version of itself because the wave is automatically going up and down, up and down. So if you shift by half a wavelength, it's perfectly natural to become negative of itself. So now that everything is a wave and including electron, for it to become the negative of itself as a wave is not that unusual at all. So it seems a bit odd, but not a problem really. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. And there was a big puzzle in quantum, which Bose, uh, an Indian physicist in 1920s, actually solved, that when we think of things like electrons, which are all the same, there is a fundamental issue here, which is you can no longer label the first electron and the second electron and the third electron as electron number one, electron number two, electron number three. In other words, because they are the same kind of object, they truly are indistinguishable and things can swap around, an electron can swap with another electron, and you cannot tell the difference. They're all indistinguishable to you as far as you're concerned. They may know about each other, but you don't know which is which anymore. So everything is mixable because they're truly indistinguishable. So this explained a lot of things in quantum, and I'm not, since we don't have visual here, I'm not gonna show you slide 17, but this is an analogy which you can click on the, uh, graphic on the bottom and sort of see a little movie that if you play this little game that you're going to roll one quarter around the other uh, and you bring the quarter at the top down to the bottom and you make sure that they're rolling you will see that if you bring the top quarter down to the bottom the bottom quarter doesn't change at all heads up but the top quarter will also rotate by 360 degrees and again, be heads up. So the action of swapping the two quarters in this particular way, the top becomes the bottom and the bottom becomes the top, 
is the same action as rotating one of them by 360 degrees. There's a beautiful description of this by Feynman in his uh, lectures, which I, which I recommend. So this is just an analogy, but what this means, if you go to slide 18, is that the wave describing two electrons has a very particular property. Swapping the two electrons is the same thing as rotating one of the electrons by 360 degrees and leaving the other one alone. So now by Dirac's picture, that means the whole wave, the two electron wave, has become the negative of itself because that's what this special electron thing does. When you rotate by 360 degrees, it becomes a negative of itself. So that's fine. It just says all composite uh, two electron objects become the negative of themselves when you swap the two electrons. Fine. So this is called an anti-symmetry property. But now you ask a very special question. What if I try to put the two electrons in the same place at the same time? This addresses our fundamental understanding of matter. Why is matter always at a separate place from every other matter? Why can't it all just stick down to the same point? And why doesn't everything collapse to one point? This is the answer. The answer is if you try to squeeze two electrons to the same point, they will truly become indistinguishable to you. So if you swap them, you can no longer say one electron was here and the other was there because they're at the same place. So basic logic tells you now the composite object of the two electrons really is unchangeable. If you swap the two electrons, it has to look the same as itself because the two electrons have no difference. They're in the same place. On the other hand, the first rule on this page says one electron has rotated around itself to, so the composite object has to become negative. So this is the, a deep understanding of why matter behaves like this. So this is the origin of the Pauli exclusion principle. That the only thing that becomes a negative of itself for one reason and is the same as itself for a different reason, how can you reconcile these two completely opposite predictions? The, the quantity that you're trying to describe, the composite object has to be identically zero. In other words, there is no way for two electrons to sit exactly on top of each other because it would violate one of these two rules and it needs to satisfy them both. And so zero is the only way you can get zero equals zero and zero equals minus zero. So this cannot happen. Zero is the probability this, this composite wave has a zero answer for satisfying both rules. And so matter can never sit at the same place at the same time. So this is why when you start putting electrons together around an atom, you build up the atom to go from a small distance to a larger distance to a larger distance, because every electron has to have its own space, so to speak. You, you can't squeeze more than, uh, there's a reason why you have to squeeze two, but not more than that. So that's why an atom gets bigger and bigger as you put more atoms, uh, more electrons piling up. And so that explains why everything has a volume. Now, when these atoms combine, the volume concept goes along. Okay. So this is how far we got along with some basic rules in particle physics. Uh, Dirac had a lot to do with, along with many other people. So this is our theory of matter particles, which were called after Enrico Fermi, they were called fermions. Okay, now let's get to the other aspect of this reductionist approach, which is how do you explain forces? So this logic, you know, if you take a mechanics course, uh, maybe as an undergrad, and you learn about Newton's laws and you learn about Newton's laws being applied in particular frames of reference. But then you say, what if I try to apply it in an accelerating frame of reference, uh, like the surface of the earth, which is rotating? Then you say, ah, oh, you can't do that. Then F equals MA doesn't stand on its own like this. You get these additional terms uh, incorporated into your equations called Coriolis force and stuff like this. And so what are these additional force-like things coming from? And the answer is, ah, it's because your coordinate system is changing. So when you say, let's see how the object behaves when you move it from one point to another point, it's not just the motion of the object which is changing, it's that the coordinate system is also changing under you. First it was pointing in one direction and now it's pointing in the other direction. So the changing coordinate system when you differentiate, you're also inducing the change in the coordinate system, not in the not alone in the object itself. So Newton's laws was trying to tell you 
what causes the change in the object uh, is the acceleration of the object. But what about the change in the coordinate system? Don't you need some additional terms that describe that? And the answer indeed is yes. That's the origin of the Coriolis force. It's trying to change. It's trying to describe the rotation of the Earth. Um, and that has some physical manifestation as well. So this idea of you know these fictitious forces or these artificially generated forces in in accelerated frames of reference, this is taken seriously, and we say let's imagine that everything that we know, electrons and all everything, are permanently living in accelerating frames. There is no such thing as a non-inertial frame for an electron. So whenever an electron changes, there are these fictitious force terms that the electron will experience. But because we don't know what is fictitious, what is not fictitious anymore, because we're always living in an accelerating frame, these so-called fictitious forces, therefore, are the real forces. The electron will always experience them because it doesn't know anything else. It doesn't know how to differentiate between fictitious and non-fictitious. So this logic is actually taken to its extreme and says, we can describe the origin of all forces fundamentally by actually simply saying all fundamental particles live in curved spaces. And that's the reason they experience these forces from a very basic reason. It, it's the same Coriolis force logic applied, but this time you can't call them fictitious. They are the real forces because you don't know the difference. So just like on the surface of the earth, you can ask why the hurricanes seem to rotate. It's not that the earth is really rotating, it's more like the Earth is rotating the other way underneath the air. So every time we visualize a hurricane, it's the Earth's rotation gets imprinted on the hurricane. And so it looks to us like the Earth is, uh, like the winds are rotating like this when a hurricane forms. It's a manifestation of the Earth's rotation below, so to speak. So it's this, rot this Coriolis force effect is now attributed to every electron and that's the origin of the electromagnetic force and every other force we ever described is coming along that way. Okay, so we are on slide 21, let's go to 22. The next thing that happens in quantum is you, you describe forces by particle exchange. So if you go to slide 23, this is Feynman, Richard Feynman describing forces between electrons as the exchange of a quantum of radiation. So this is the electromagnetic radiation after quantization, it becomes a photon that carries sort of one unit of electromagnetic energy and electromagnetic momentum. So energy and momentum are being exchanged between the two electrons, and that creates the impression of a force between the two electrons. Okay. So this idea was working beautifully. Electromagnetism is the most exactly tested theory ever. I mean, experiments are checking out this logic up to an extreme high level of precision. You see 0.3 parts per trillion. This is probably the most, maybe one of the most accurate things that we have a prediction for and we have a measurement for and the two agree at the highest level of precision we've ever achieved, I guess, in human history. So it's quite a you know, remarkable thing. You can calculate something so accurately, you can measure something so accurately, and they both agree. Big deal. So now you go to slide 25 and you say, let's apply the same logic to the weak force, the next force that happens in the nucleus. Uh, so we have electromagnetism, we have the strong force, and we have this weak force as well. So the weak force, as you see in this picture, is causing the uh, what is called beta decay. Um, and so a neutron is turning into a proton emitting an electron and a neutrino. And you see the picture on the right-hand side showing the quark level uh, description of this. So this theory came along somewhere in the 50s. How do we describe the weak interaction? Let's apply the same Coriolis force logic. And so this works pretty well. The two particles which are turning into each other, like the electron and the neutrino, or the neutron and the proton, that pair you put at the poles of this ball, it's just like the Earth spinning around. And so the poles represent the two matter particles which are turning into each other. And what's the force? The action of going from the South Pole to the North Pole or the North Pole to the South Pole or going around the equator, these are the things you can do to the ball, just like the Earth spinning. And so the three kinds of actions you can make are becoming the three mediators of the weak force. 
So the one that goes up is the W positive, the one that goes down is the W negative, and the one that goes around the equator is the Z boson. So that's the W minus, W minus, and the Z. So that's the trio of forces uh, which are coming along with this picture of transforming the two matter particles into each other. And so that's our description. It's like a symmetry property. The ball is a symmetry operation. You can turn the two matter particles into each other, and that action is mediating the force. That's what the force does. So this W boson is quite important. So we typically say, you know, what does all this fit into my daily life? If you see on slide 25, that's nuclear fusion going on in the sun's core. And we know how it all starts. It's got protons in the beginning and it ends up with helium. And so there is a difference in the energy of protons versus helium, four protons versus helium. And so that difference in energy is coming out by E equals MC square as the energy output of the sun. So if you watch that reaction, first two protons have to fuse, it becomes a deuterium atom, proton and a neutron, that fuses some more and then becomes tritium, uh, sorry, it becomes helium three, and then helium three fuses again and becomes helium four and out come two protons. If you watch the time scales, the first reaction is actually the slowest. So that's what controls how quickly nuclear fusion or how slowly nuclear fusion is happening. And that's why the sun produces a certain amount of energy and it lives 10 billion years. Otherwise, if that first reaction was faster, the sun would burn much hotter and much faster and it would be a very different. It would probably would not be a solar system. There'd be way too much energy coming out. So why is that first reaction happening in that very billion year time scale? It's because the force that turns the proton into a neutron, which is our W, is very, very massive. And so because of that, that reaction is very, very slow. So we are actually very lucky that the W boson is so massive and that's why the reaction is so slow and that's why the sun burns at the steady rate at which life can be supported and planets can form and so forth. The other thing uh, that is crucial for us is why the earth itself has a hot core in the middle. So the reason it remains molten and doesn't freeze up like the moon is because the radioactivity mediated by the W boson in the uh, in inside the Earth, that radioactivity is producing quite a bit of the energy that is keeping the Earth molten. It's not the complete answer, but it's a big part of the answer. So why is it so important for the Earth's core to be remain molten? Because that core is uh, iron and nickel, and a molten core is conducting electricity, and so it's rotating, not frozen up. And by rotating this conducting core, it produces a magnetic field. There's an electrical current there producing a magnetic field. So what's the importance of the Earth's magnetic field? It's taking all the charged particles coming out of the sun and deflecting them from the equator up to the poles. So that's why we get the aurora borealis, the northern lights and the southern lights, is because all the solar radiation gets deflected to the poles. And so when it interacts with the atmosphere at the poles, it produces the neon tube, neon light effect. Uh, you know, the, the atmosphere lights up because of the electrical currents there. But if all this radiation had come straight down to the Earth's surface without this magnetic shield, it would have been too much of a radiation um, exposure, shall we say. And so the evolution of life and so on in the surface of the Earth would have been very, very difficult with that much of a radiation dose. Um, hitting the Earth's surface. So we are very lucky to have this magnetic shield. Um, and so now when we look for exoplanets and the possibility of life, one of the considerations is, does that planet have a, a, a core which will generate a magnetic field, uh, which will then protect the surface of the planet from the nearest star, radiation from the nearest star. So these are some manifestations of where the heavy W boson, even though we don't know it, is sort of really crucial in keeping us alive on the surface of the Earth. So let's go to slide 28. This theory is all wonderful, but I've just described why the, the importance of the W boson being so massive is important. On the other hand, the Coriolis force logic, the symmetry transformation logic, uh, really requires all particles to be massless. And massless particle is just saying the symmetry transformation because it's you can do it at will, it cannot have an energy cost. If there's an energy cost, it's like an energy barrier, and you cannot have an energy barrier for something which is a symmetry transformation. 
So that's the reason the mass, the, the force mediating particles have to be massless. And that's why the photon is massless. So something is broken with this logic when it comes to the weak interaction. The W bosons being massive doesn't fit in. So now you've got to create like a kludge. You've got to creep all, keep all the other math working because everything else is fine. But you've got to mess up the theory in just the right way so that you don't destroy all the other magic, but you generate a mass-like property for the W boson. So how do you do that? So this is where the ideas of Higgs and others kicked in that will keep all of this logic the same. So if you go to slide 29, we'll just fill space with some condensate, something called the Higgs field will magically appear and it's gonna fill all of the vacuum and everything that is moving through the vacuum is now actually moving through this Higgs stuff. And as it goes through the Higgs, it's gonna experience something like friction. And if it's got more friction, it will slow down more and so appear to be more massive. So that's the special relativity logic kicking in. That slow things are not moving at the speed of light because of their large mass and massless things are moving at the speed of light because they have zero mass. So that's shown on the next slide. If you go to slide 20, sorry, 30, it's a very crude analogy, but it kind of works that if you had a streamlined object, it would go through water rather easily. So low friction, so it's got a high speed. And that's the analogy of something like an electron, which is has a very small interaction with the Higgs. So it's got a small friction coefficient, shall we say. And so it can go fast and so it appears like a light particle. But something that has a large friction will have a large drag like a crayfish. So, you know, that can't move fast through water because if it tried, it just has too large a friction coefficient. So all the heavy particles are like the crayfish. They have a large friction coefficient. The light particles have a small friction coefficient. So it, it's not a very pleasant picture, but it works. And we are testing it at the LHC right now, if this is the right picture. But it's a picture that's working so far uh, in describing how different particles end up getting different masses because of their interaction with the Higgs. So finally, if you go to slide 31, you see what the Higgs boson is all about. If you want to know that there is water filling up space, well, you are in the water. So how would you know anything different? What you can do is you try to make a wave in the water, like a sound wave or a ripple on the surface of the water. And if there is something there, then you'll be able to make ripples. And when you see the ripple, then you actually know, yeah, I, I can make a wave in this water. So I know the water is really there because I can see a wave on it or I can see sound coming through it. So the action of creating waves in the Higgs is what we call creating the Higgs boson. So boson is like a single quantized ripple coming through the Higgs field. Okay, so that's where we are. If you go to slide 32, we've now got this matter content. It's a great success. Um, lots and lots of matter particles. You can see six on the top, six on the bottom. But their masses are a bizarre thing, and we're just blaming it on their Higgs interaction for the moment. We don't have any better idea than that. I mean, there are lots of good ideas, but we don't have a proof that there's anything more going on than just the simple logic. So in physics, in all science, we're always sticking to this basic idea. You always have to go with the simplest explanation that works. There could be a more detailed explanation but unless you see some evidence that really distinguishes between the more fancy explanation and the simplest one, you got to go with the simplest one. Otherwise, you're just speculating all over. Okay? You're free to speculate, but you can't call that a proven theory yet. Okay, so on slide 33, that's where we are. We've got a theory of matter, we've got a theory of forces, and all of that fits beautifully into this really compact equation on page 33. The psi are the matter particles and the F are the, the force things, and they have their own kinetic energy and so forth. Um, and this simple looking equation is actually describing matter, forces, and the interaction between matter and forces, kinetic energy, and all of this good stuff. So there's a lot of math behind it, but once you put the math into this elegant formulation, this is where the standard model has been working so beautifully. Okay, so so furthermore with the W. So sounds like now we've got a theory of the W, we got its mass, everything is fine, right? Not really. So the plot thickens when we go to page 34, and this is where the W starts becoming more and more important. 
uh, well, I've been talking for quite a while. Let me keep going. Um, I don't have a time constraint. You know, feel free to leave if you have to. But let me keep going with this story. So what's this business of a quantum form? So let's go to slide 35. We come back to this uncertainty principle. I flipped it around. I put the time on the denominator and the energy in the numerator, which is saying that if you want to measure the, the energy of a system accurately, any wave-like system, any quantum system, it takes an infinitely long time to do it. If you make an, a measurement over a small amount of time, then you'll automatically be forced to not know the energy of the system very precisely. So the more accurately you try to measure time, the less accurately you know, you know the energy, uh, or vice versa. Okay? So this is sort of like an analogy with a loan system. So you go to a bank and you say, I want to borrow some energy from you. And the bank says, how much? And you say, well, give me as much as you like, as much as I want. And he says, OK, you can have a million dollars, but you can only have it for a day. you got to return the money within a day, so nobody will find out. Uh, no collateral asked. If you say, I want a trillion dollars, it will say, that's fine, but you can only have it for a second. And if you say, well, I want a thousand trillion dollars, the bank will say, that's fine. You can only have it for a millionth of a second or a thousandth of a second, if I do the math right. In other words, you can always borrow more and more energy as long as you do it for a shorter and shorter amount of time. Within that amount of time, you've got to return that energy and whatever you're doing with that energy has to disappear because nobody can ever find out that you violated energy conservation. So you're free to violate energy conservation. Nature can violate energy conservation over a very short time, but nobody else can find out about it. So that's how quantum mechanics works. In other words, the vacuum is like a bubbling foam. If you, if you can somehow look over a very short amount of time, you will see enormous amounts of energy popping out of the vacuum. But before you can actually detect that, it disappears. And so you can never actually prove that energy conservation is not working, even though nature is doing it all the time. So these fluctuations have to pop in and out, in and out. And so if you do the animation on slide 36, um, there's a little bar at the bottom, you will see these things fluctuating in and out. So the question is if these sort of fluctuations are happening there, but you can never really observe one of them in, in action, then isn't all just fiction? I mean, how, how do we know these fluctuations have any anything to do with reality? So there was a brilliant experiment done in, nine, in 1955 or 54, I guess, page 37 now. Uh, Willis Lamb said, I'm going to check something out. There were a couple of states of the hydrogen atom, two energy states of the hydrogen atom, whose energy levels were exactly known. So he said, I'm going to go measure them and compare the difference of those two energies. Does that difference uh, come out to be exactly this calculated difference, or is it not the same as the calculated difference? So you see, we are getting to this logic if there is some exact prediction, you should go try and measure it. Either you get the same answer or you don't. If you don't, you learn something new. Something else is going on. So he measured a one part per million difference. And that was enough to say there's something not quite right. The rules by which we are calculating these energies is something missing there. The tiny piece missing, but it's enough to say something is missing because he observed a small difference. One part per million. So as time went on, you know, a lot of people were calculating this quantum field theory, and they eventually figured out how to do the math with these quantum fluctuations. So if you see this picture on the right hand side, you see a proton and an electron, and you see almost the same picture as before. There is a wiggly line, which is the photon in the middle. So that's mediating the electromagnetic interaction in the atom of hydrogen electron to proton. But that photon now has a quantum fluctuation in there. It's splitting up into an electron and a positron. It's a very low energy photon, so it doesn't have the actual energy to manifest these things for real. And therefore, by the rules of quantum, the electron-positron fluctuation has to disappear before it gets to this observable electron. So this quantum fluctuations are happening. You can't see them directly, but the electron-proton interaction on average is affected by these fluctuations. 
So when you calculate the effect of these fluctuations, you can actually see by the calculation that the hydrogen atom will behave just a little bit differently. So the energies of these two electron states is going to be slightly different from the original calculation, which did not incorporate these fluctuations. So when they calculated these fluctuations, they got exactly the answer that Will Islam had measured. The one part per million was explained by the fact that these vacuum fluctuations were going on. So we can actually observe their effect on average on physical things, even though we can't spot one of these fluctuations in action, so to speak. So they're averaged out, but we can see the average effect. So if you go back to, uh, go to slide 38, we talked about probing the proton inside, deep inside. So if you go to slide 39, there is a very nice calculation that was done in 73 about the vacuum fluctuations that happen for the strong force. So we just talked about the electromagnetic force, but they're also happening in the strong force. So the mediators of the strong force are also encountering these vacuum fluctuations inside the proton. It turns out that that also changes the strength of the strong force, but something really wonderful happens here. Here, the calculation showed that as you probe more and more energetically the strong force, the effect of the vacuum fluctuations is to make the strong force actually weaker. And so this was this theory of asymptotic freedom that if you probe the strong force at smaller and smaller distances, then that the same thing as higher and higher energies and the calculation shows that the strong force will actually get weaker and weaker. And so I'm coming back to the question of emergence, that actually the strong force is a very simple, very weak force if you were to go to extreme high energies. So it's a very simple picture at extreme high energies. There's almost no force. The quarks are just flying around freely. But as you then go to lower energies and you come to our world, the proton and so on, then the the small strength of the small of the, of the strong force actually gets stronger and stronger and this is not something that was done by hand it's quantum mechanics itself which is generating this whole dynamically emergent phenomena that more and more of these vacuum fluctuations are happening and their net effect is to make the strong force stronger and stronger and eventually the strong force through this emergent logic becomes strong enough that all the quarks and everything become bound inside the proton. So they can't fly around anymore. So at extremely small distances, they are flying around freely, but by the time you get to this, uh, the size of the proton, the strong force becomes strong enough to stick them together. So this is called confinement. And this is, has really been understood now as a very you know, beautiful, uh, calculation from quantum mechanics that the emergent phenomena coming from quantum mechanics is explaining why we don't see free quarks and why we don't see these particles which are bound inside the proton as free particles. If you want to see them, you can only see them indirectly by smashing the protons at very high energy. Then you are down to probing the distances at very small distance scales. Only then the quarks appear to be free. If you look at a proton size quark, it's all bound up and you'll never see a free quark. So, so that explains the big puzzle of why the theory of quarks was working so well, and yet you could never see free quarks because for this reason, they were bound up uh, inside, okay? I am going to go rather quickly now in the, just in the interest of time. And if you have time, we can come back to this. From slide 40 onwards, I'm gonna give you just a rapid view so just a few seconds on each slide so let's just start flipping through 40 41 and so on it's about dark matter we know that dark matter is 80 percent uh, 85 percent of the matter in the universe it is a big halo around our galaxies where the dark matter is like a cloud uh 42 the galaxies are distributed in a very strange pattern over the universe now we've got measurements showing that dark matter is also following the same distribution in the universe. It's not spread out uniformly. It's clumped in a very interesting way, like filaments. And we've seen galaxies now which are almost 90, 95% dark matter, not the typical 80% or 85%, very faint galaxies. 
and the distribution of galaxies in the universe is page 44 is following this very filamental like distribution so a lot of work was done to understand why the universe has evolved this way page 45 mentions this cosmic microwave background radiation which was discovered in 1964 it's a very uniform almost uniform distribution of radio waves over the entire sky and it's so uniform that it was a big puzzle how can it be so uniform then we fast forward to the 80s that's slide 46 and people started measuring this radio waves all over the universe very very high precision 0.001 percent and then they started seeing tiny variations in this intensity of these radio waves slightly more here and slightly less there that's this color coded map they started measuring that more precisely so slide 47 even more precisely slide 48 and this pattern of of radio wave fluctuations became so precise that it started telling us something about the early universe what was causing this radio wave distribution to be almost uniform but not quite where did this form so this radio wave pattern formed early in the universe like 400,000 years after the big bang so so you can ask the question what is the origin of these tiny fluctuations on it and the reason is on slide 49 the quantum foam that we were describing that's happening now in the vacuum everywhere in the proton all around us these things are also going on in the beginning of the universe at the time of the big bang so the fluctuations were coming and going coming and going causing little density fluctuations here and there but the universe was expanding very rapidly at the same time so that expansion actually created a lot of energy and so these fluctuations which typically would just disappear before you can spot them because of the expanding universe the energy became available to actually freeze them in space and so the quantum fluctuations actually became real fluctuations because the energy was actually there and so those little density fluctuations at that time caused gravitational attraction to pull the dark matter towards them which then pulled the visible matter towards it so all the reason for the galaxies to be formed because of these density fluctuations causing attraction and for the galaxies to be distributed in this strange sort of random pattern over the universe is because of the randomness of the quantum fluctuations happening right there in the beginning which seeded all of this stuff so the, the seeds for the the galaxy formation and the structure formation in the universe started with the quantum fluctuations which then got picked up by the dark matter which then got picked up by the visible matter and that got imprinted on this radio wave pattern from the beginning of the universe which we are also seeing in the cosmic microwave background so now this whole story makes sense but in some sense we owe some of our existence to these quantum fluctuations not even not just now but also in the beginning of the universe okay so now let's go to page 51 and finally we see what the w boson can tell us about these fluctuations so slide 52 you see these pictures these are called Feynman diagrams they're a way of depicting quantum fluctuations you can see like a wavy line which is the w boson it suddenly has a quantum fluctuations into some matter particles the top quark and the bottom quark you probably heard about those and then before you can spot it the fluctuation disappears you go back to a w boson the next picture shows a Higgs boson coming off a W before you can spot that goes back into the W so the quantum fluctuation comes and goes now you don't know what else is going on in nature suppose there are additional particles new kinds of matter additional force mediators whatever if the W boson interacts with those then those fluctuations must always occur as well so there is a rule in quantum that says whatever is not prohibited by some rule has to happen so it's not like you get to ask why do some things happen and why do some things not happen everything that can happen must happen if there is some rule that prevents it then fine if there is no such rule that prevents it it will happen that's the way quantum works so if this x particle exists then its quantum fluctuation has to happen as well even though we don't know about x 
nature not robotics so here's the name of the game we'll take our quantum field theory we'll calculate all the known quantum fluctuation effects they influence the mass of the w boson in a calculable way so we can do those calculations so you can put in the top quark you can put in the higgs boson and you can calculate what the w boson mass will be because of these vacuum fluctuations and you get a number so that's the number on the next page slide 53 in our units 8357 forget about the number notice the accuracy of that number it's in the last digit 7357 plus or minus 4 plus or minus 4 so it's a pretty accurate number so now our, that's my motivation all these years if you can measure this quantity to the same level of precision as the calculation you get to ask the very interesting question do we get the same answer or do we not and if if you don't, you know what the implication is. On slide 52, something like X might be going around in nature. You can now have a theory of the X particle as left, as, a, as uh, in addition, make a calculation from that and see if this measured number agrees more with your new hypothesis or the original 8357. And if your new hypothesis is closer, then you get to say, huh, maybe, maybe the new hypothesis is the right answer and the standard model is not the whole story. So that's the game. So slide 54, for example, if you heard about supersymmetry, that's been a theory favorite for many people for decades. We haven't seen any experimental evidence for it, but it's a very powerful theory for many reasons. It explains many things, but we have to find some proof. So when you put these particles into those quantum fluctuations, you get a calculable answer and you can ask the question, is the W boson more consistent with a theory including supersymmetry or a theory without supersymmetry? And you get to keep asking this question for every new theory you have. There's one standard model theory, but there's a whole bunch of alternatives. Okay, so slide 45, I think. Here's a picture, look at the X, Y axis, sorry, the vertical axis. Um, you see the mass of the W boson and the green region is the supersymmetry calculation. This was way back in 98. You didn't even know what the Higgs boson was then, so you had to try different hypotheses. The, the blue circle is telling you how well we had measured the W boson. Not very well back then, so you couldn't differentiate between the hypotheses. You can see that the green region and the red region, both of them, are allowed by the blue circle. So you don't know the difference between them. So all you got to do now is try to pull the, the circle to become smaller and smaller. And that means you're making a measurement that's more and more precise. At some point you get to see whether you land in the green region or the red region. Okay. So how do you make the measurement? By the way, on slide 56, the red region collapsed because in 2012 we measured the mass of the Higgs, we discovered the Higgs measured the mass, and then the standard model became a very precise calculation. So that purple line is where the W boson would have to be on if the standard model was right and there was nothing more to, to nature. Uh, if there was more to nature, you would get a different answer. It would not be on the line. Okay, so how do you make the measure? Okay, slide 57 you'll see what this measurement shows up as, and you see what I, I hear the shock wave. And it's because that orange little circle is small and it's not in the purple line anymore. So something is going on, something more than the theory we've taken a century to establish. So what's the name of the game in terms of measurement? I think I'm going to flash through this stuff quickly. How do you measure the mass with 0.1% accuracy? So it's a tricky thing because the W, as we said, decays to a, a particle like an electron or a muon that you can measure very well. So you do. But the other particle is a neutrino, which is complete, almost completely invisible. So you don't know its energy. You don't know its direction. So when you say E equals mc square, measuring the mass of the W boson means measure the energy of the decay products, add up the energies. That's E equals mc square. That's how you figure out the M. But if you can't see half the energy, half the momentum, you're kind of stuck. So that's what makes it much more complicated. You've got to infer some of the things that you would need to know. And so it takes many, many years to do some careful analysis and infer these things. Okay, 
Let's flash through a few pictures. Slide 60 shows you a typical detector configuration, collisions happening in the middle, particles flying out. These things act like filters, these sensors. So each layer measures some type of particle. And when you combine that old picture, you can say, aha, this must have been a muon, this must have been a proton, that must have been a photon. It's like multicolored filters and you see the coincidences. When you see multiple signals, you know what's going on. Here's a picture of one of our detectors, concentric cylinders you can sort of see on page 61. Uh, one of the detectors is being installed. So this whole thing is about three or four stories high, 40, 40 feet or so. And here's a detector about one and a half meters in radius. Uh, that's one of the key ones making the, that's making this measurement possible. So it's a large cylinder. I'm gonna show you a picture of what's inside the cylinder. So let's go to slide 64. The, the covering of the cylinder has been taken out. So inside you see these gold plated wires and there's high voltage on these wires. So when a charge particle comes through, it ionizes the gas and the ions being charged are now drifting towards the wires because the wires have a voltage, so they attract the charge. So whichever wires pick up the electrical charge, you know that those wires are the ones that the charge particle you were interested in went close to. So it's like a proximity detector. And you just fill the whole volume with lots and lots of these sensors so you can track all the particles coming out of the collision. So slide 65 shows you how one of these detectors work. You see the points uh, are the wires, high voltage, low voltage, a charged particle coming through, makes positive ions on one side and electrons on the other. They drift towards the respective wires. So whichever wire picks up the drifted charge, you know that the charged particle came through close to that one. And then you figure out the distance and you know the exact position. So slide 68, once you got a whole bunch of positions, you say, what do I do with those? Because I put the whole device in a magnetic field, the charged particles are all going around in circular trajectories uh, through the magnetic field, it's electromagnetism. So now you measure the radius of the circle. So you've traced out the circle by measuring the positions. The radius of the circle is proportional to the momentum. So now you make the measurement of the circular radius as accurately as possible, that tells you the momentum. Assuming you know the magnetic field. So it's all math at this point. If you know this number, you know this number, multiply, divide, you know the energy of the particle. So slide 67 shows your typical event display, you know, that cylindrical detector. You see all the sensor layers. What are all this mess of, uh, of black points? Every black point is one of those wires telling you a charged particle went near me. But there are a hundred charged particles being produced. So you get lots and lots of black dots where all the little wires are lighting up. You've got to trace through all those dots. It's like connect the dots uh, pattern, like a game. But instead of tracing out, you know, the shape of a frog or a bird, like we used to do as kids, you've got to trace out thousands and thousands of these points, figure out the circles that are going through every little collection of points so that all the hundred particles are traced out. So this you cannot do by eye anymore. So we've got lots of that. So, you know, millions of lines of sophisticated software, which will take this pattern of dots and try to figure out the, the little circles through them. So all the blue circles are all the trajectories of the charged particles that you've inferred from that dense pattern of dots. It's a, it's a nice program. It takes a lot of time to write it, but does a lot of good work. And one of those particles you can see, that purple line, that's the electron. And you know it's a high energy particle because it didn't bend very much. You can see by eye, the line is almost straight. And then there's another sensor called the calorimeter. You can see the big purple blob there. Uh, and that's detecting the energy of the electron in a very different way. So again, you see this coincidence. You see a high momentum particle in the inner detector and another high energy particle in the outer detector, and they are coinciding in energy and in position. So that's got to be an electron because an electron behaves exactly that way. So that's how we tell a high energy electron was produced inside all this mess. On the other side of the electron, you say, but and momentum must be conserved. So where's the energy going on the other side? Uh, 
but there isn't any you you see look at that picture carefully and you don't find any and that's how you know it's got to be a neutrino a neutrino is not detectable so the momentum carried by the neutrino was not found in the detector so this has got to be a w boson event because you see the high energy electron on one side and you're inferring the neutrino on the other side and only a w boson does that so this is how you infer that this has got to be a w boson event okay I am going to, let me see if I can go a little faster. Slide 68, 69. They are a very interesting technique. I, you see, I published that with a colleague of mine in a, in a different paper. You heard me mention, we've got to measure the radius of that circle. Every charged particle makes a circle. We've got to measure that radius very accurately, which means we've got to know the positions of those wires very accurately. And this is describing a technique of measuring those positions at the level of one micron. So if you just look at the plot at the bottom of slide 69, y-axis is showing in microns the positions of these wires. And you see the scatter is down at the level of one micron or less. And the x-axis is labeling different wires. So there's lots and lots of wires. For every one of those wires, the position has been measured uh, down to an accuracy of one micron. The top plot is before this special technique was used, and you can see the points are scattered by 50 microns, if you see the y-axis. Uh, so they were not known very well initially, but we were able to measure their positions. So this one micron accuracy then turns into the radius being measured very accurately, and that means we can infer the energy of the particle very accurately. And that's crucial, because that accuracy then turns into the accuracy of the mass of the W boson. That's a very small part of the story, but a big part. There's lots and lots of this. Measure this, measure this, measure this. Slide 70 shows you one more measurement. I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can ask me. But it's telling you we can now calibrate the magnetic field, which is the other thing you need to know, to a precision of 25 parts per million. And if you put the position measurement and the field measurement together, now you know the momentum of the particles to something like 25 parts per million. Slide 71 is a demonstration of that. This is saying we can try to measure the mass of the Z boson ourselves. It's been done before. It's been done very accurately before. But as a proof that we can do it as accurately or almost as accurately, we are going to measure the mass of the Z boson ourselves using all this stuff we talked about. And then make the case, look, compare our measurement done independently to the well-known measurement from before. So you can look at these two numbers on slide 71, and you see they're in agreement. So this is our way of showing you want to trust our W boson mass measurement. One of the things we'll prove is we can make the Z boson mass measurement as well and look at its accuracy and look at its consistency. And that works out. So that's lending some support to the fact that our W boson mass measurement uh, is, is reliable, at least for some reasons. Okay. I'd like to emphasize this, because one of the things we've done in this analysis for the last three times, so 2006, 2012, and now 2022, we've published three times. This is a demonstration that we've done every single time with more and more accuracy as a proof of concept. There are other colleagues, you know, other experiments are making the W bond boson mass measurement as well. But this is one demonstration that we have always done, which nobody else has ever done. They, they use other techniques, which, you know, you can ask, again, you know, questions about how that technique is demonstrated to work and what is the proof of its validity and so on. And we can have that long conversation. But part of our game is we are trying to make this demonstration and nobody else has been able to make this demonstration. Okay, so I'm gonna move on rather quickly. Slide 72 shows, well, how exactly do you use the data to tell you what the mass has to be? There is this energy plot being made, and you can see a red curve on slide 72 and a, and a blue curve, and the data is gonna follow one of these two curves. So what's the difference? We have a calculation showing for the W boson mass of 80, the blue curve would be what the data would look like. If it was 81, the red curve is what the data would look like. 
And of course, you have thousands and thousands of these calculations for every possible mass of the W boson between 80 and 81. So one of those will be the one that best describes the data. Whichever curve is the one picked out by the data, we will see what's the mass value associated with that one because we are doing all the calculations. And that's how we infer the mass of the W boson. Okay? So if you go to slide 73, you'll see the actual picture. This is where the value comes from. You see little blue points, that's the data distribution of that quantity. The red curve overlying it is the one that best fits. So the one that's picked out by the data, and the comparison is done by a statistical technique called maximum likelihood estimation, standard statistics technique. And so that value leads to the value on the next slide, which is slide 74. So on the y-axis, 80.433 80 .33 billion electron volts. That value comes out from that statistical comparison of data and simulation that you saw in the previous picture. So this is what the science paper concludes at. Well, it's very different uh, from that purple curve. So something's up. People have been, of course, referencing our paper quite a bit. I haven't, so I'm on slide 75 now. I haven't kept track of what the latest reference count is, but a few weeks uh, into this paper, so this paper was published March, 7, March, sorry, April 7th. I think it came out in print April 8th. Somebody, one of my friends went out on April 25th, so a few weeks after, and said there are already 62 references of theorists trying to figure out what the additional new physics might be. Uh, so this is on slide 75. They made a pie chart of all the different ideas. So you see one of them, SUSY, it says, S-U-S-Y. That's short for supersymmetry. So some fraction of the people are saying, well, if supersymmetry was like this, that would explain what CDF is measuring. There's a whole bunch of other ideas here. You know, we can go into the technical details of what they're postulating. I'm sure there are many more ideas that come out by now. Um, I keep track a little bit, but uh, can't keep up. So um, 76, 77, 78, there is one other mystery called the missing antimatter. I think if time allows, I'll come back to this. So let's just flip forward. If you see 77, 78, 79, 80, 81. Let me just fast forward to slide 81. Um, a series of rules was written down by Andrei Sakharov, who was a, uh, a brilliant theorist. Um, he was one of the people behind the Soviet version of the atomic bomb, hydrogen bomb, I think. But later on, he became dissident and he fell out of favor of the government, obviously, for that reason, and became a big activist for peace and so forth. Um, about the peaceful uses of nuclear power, but not the weapons and so forth. But coming back to his science, he wrote down some conditions about what would have to happen in the beginning of the universe so that there would be more matter than antimatter created. And so after most of the matter antimatter annihilated away, a little bit of the excess matter is left over. And that little bit of excess matter is what is making up the galaxies and the stars and atoms and the earth and us and everything else. If this little excess wasn't left over, there wouldn't be anything to create all this stuff out of. So those special conditions, called Sakharov conditions, some of them are actually possible with our existing standard model theory, but some of them are not. So that's already telling us, given that we do see excess matter in the universe, there has to be some missing physics in the standard model. We don't know what that missing physics is, but we know something about what that missing physics has to satisfy. It has to satisfy some of these Sakharov conditions. So now you can go back and say, well, all these new ideas trying to explain our latest W mass, do any of these ideas help to satisfy some of the missing Sakharov conditions? And the answer is yes. Some of them do, in fact. One of those ideas is, why does there have to be a single Higgs? Now that you found one, couldn't there be more? Couldn't there be more of this stuff going on? We've certainly got more than one force. We've certainly got more than one matter particle. We've got lots and lots of matter particles. 
lots and lots of forces, four forces actually, three quantum. So why not more than one Higgs? So if you make a theory with additional Higgs, it's easy to make such a theory that would satisfy one of the important Sakharov conditions, a condition not satisfied by the standard model right now. So you, that doesn't prove that additional Higgs exist, but it says it's plausible because this W boson favors that theory and because it favors the Sakharov condition that we know exists. So that's not a proof. You need to see the additional Higgs at the LHC or something, but it gives you at least some motivation to go look for it. So let's try to wrap up. Place 82, you see the measured number in purple. You see the calculated standard model number in black. You can do basic math and see that's called the seven sigma variation or seven sigma difference. In general, in the scientific community, phi sigma is the prop. It's a measure of probability. How odd is this measurement? Uh, what's the random chance that the measurement would disagree with the calculation by this amount? Even if the calculation was right, you know, random things always happen. Measurements are measurements. So by random chance, can you get a fluctuation this big? And phi sigma means it's something like one part per three million or something like this, that it's a random chance. So that's typically the standard that three, one in a three million, that's too small. That's not a random chance. This is something really going on. So our measurement here is a little even less likely than that to be a random chance, so seven sigma. So on that note, I guess that's why you know there is no seven sigma difference from the standard model out there. No other measurement has done this. There are three sigma, four sigma uh, things out there that people are pursuing. We'll of course be pursuing this in addition, but this is the most significant thing that has ever been seen uh, that the standard model might actually not be the whole story. So on that note, uh, I'm gonna thank you for attention. I think I've kept you for an hour and a half here, I think. Uh, no problem for me, but, but uh, might be at least getting dinner time even on the West Coast. So I'm going to end on slide 84 um, that, you know, what is science about? It's not necessarily the hunt for something useful for our daily lives, but just what are the rules of nature and just satisfying your curiosity about that is itself a very fun thing. It's like finding a treasure. You know, what does that do for us? It just satisfies our curiosity about something happened in history, but it doesn't feed us or anything like that, right? You know, what does a diamond do for you? Makes us very happy, but if you're hungry, you can't eat a diamond. So it's, it's sort of like, uh, like a treasure hunt to me, uh, to some of us. So we like to say X marks the spot. So I'll just make this small joke at the end of slide 85 that maybe in the future people will say W marks the spot rather than X marks the spot. Okay, on that note, let me stop right here. Uh, free to take questions. Uh, I'm here as long as you want me to. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Like you brought us um, from how the universe works, basically, <laughs> to your research. Okay, and it was really amazing. So yeah. we really appreciate that. And uh, please flash your microphones if you have questions. Um, uh, Serena, thank you. Go ahead, and Frank, and uh, we'll go from there. Then, thank you. Well, I just want to applaud the work. Um, right, it, was a, it was a, a, an amazing, amazing story, and and the the result is actually you know stellar. And um, you know, in the Higgs boson, they uncorked the wine at five sigma. You 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 went seven sigma. You just nailed this thing, and I just want to um, appreciate that and and recognize that. Thanks so much. Wonderful. I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, the way you wove the story with the quantum fluctuations and uh, the interaction that, you know, you can, you can borrow energy, but you've got to give it back. And um, I'm, I've always been curious if in that moment you borrowed that energy and, uh, you know, that those fluctuations were in proximity and they created for that, those moments, you know, particles that interact in a sense that reaction of some sort happened and it got complicated. And so the return of the energy wasn't as simple. 
as 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 it it is that what underlies some of the density fluctuations in the expanding universe and um and how that would relate to um, i mean i'm very curious about of course as as this growing body of of work um following your your discovery you know what is the new physics that's going on and um you know were were you were if you were prone to be taking bets what would be your favorite you know pet theory that's emerging as to what what's new and uh, what's behind it <laughs> pet theory so my i guess my pet theories are the ones you know this principle this principle of occam's razor right so you want the minimal explanation with the maximum return on it so you got to explain as many phenomena as possible ideally make some predictions in the future which will then be borne out by experiment in the future that's really the test of any any good theory is not just it explains something that you already know like a post diction but it says if this is true then go look over there and something else will happen this way and i'm already telling you what's going to happen and then you do the experiment and that's exactly what happens that's a prediction mm-hmm. so when some theory actually makes a prediction and that comes out right then it's really it stood the test of sort of scientific scrutiny on the mm-hmm. theory mm-hmm. so so the alternate theories being proposed you saw a slide at the end a whole bunch of them about additional matter content additional force content additional higgs content supersymmetry all of them are making a bunch of predictions but of course we are going to be checking out those predictions through a series of experiments at the large hadron collider and dedicated experiments will also come along and neutrino experiments will come along so at the moment we don't have any way of actually uh, like you said it's all about just placing a bet Uh, can't choose favorites we have to check them all <laughs> so so now you ask well you, you know where would i place my bet and what would be the next experiment i would do because i'm my gut feeling is over there so my gut feeling is couple of them this matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe the logics that explain rather simply that maybe one yes. or two additional higgs bosons will create the right condensation mechanism in the beginning of the universe when all this was forming the higgs started with no value and then as the theory goes it created a value what we call the the, the vacuum is now filled with the higgs that generates the mass for everything else when this process was happening if it happened a slightly different way you could satisfy a sakharov condition and get the matter antimatter asymmetry which we know exists so the simplest way to do it is to add a single higgs boson to the mix so you have two higgs bosons rather than one that is enough to do it so that's one reason i like that idea so one of my analyses with collaborators on the lhc is going to now be to look for the kind of second higgs boson predicted by some of these theories and they're actually a little more predictive they tell you what that other higgs boson would have to be like what its mass would need to be roughly speaking and what it would do to the rest of the particles roughly speaking so if it worked out that way that a second higgs boson was found with those kinds of properties that would let a lot of credence to that mechanism so one of my bets is which i'm going to be working on is look for a second higgs boson second bet the existence of dark matter we know there is dark matter we do not know that it's particles it doesn't have to be particles on the other hand i'm betting that everything else we've ever probed has always been made up of particles at the end of the day that there is nothing other than dark matter which is not particles so let's take the bet that dark matter will also turn out to be some kind of new particle after all we've seen darkish particles before you know the neutrino is almost dark it was took a people thought we could never observe a neutrino eventually we figured out how to observe the neutrino so it's 
very faint, if not dark. So there are even standard model particles which are very difficult to detect. So the next particle beyond the standard model, dark matter, turns out to be also difficult to detect, uh, not a surprise. So theories that extend the standard model and include the possibility of a dark matter particle are my next bet. So what if for, you know, there are mechanisms that you could actually produce dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider? So if these dark matter particles were produced at the beginning of the universe, how? Because we had enough energy back then to make these additional particles, just like we made the Higgs and everything else. So the LHC may have that kind of energy, not guaranteed, but may have. So the LHC could produce the dark matter right now while it's operating. So the same mechanism by which the dark matter got produced in the beginning of the universe may be active even now at the LHC. We just aren't able to spot that because the dark matter is difficult to detect by its very nature. And so we just don't have the technology to find the dark matter production characteristics at the LHC. So that's a bet I am placing personally in a big way. I'm trying to create a technology which will identify the patterns in these LHC collisions. You saw me show you a W boson event where a particular pattern shows up uh, in your sensors. These patterns are all happening very fast in nanoseconds and then disappearing. So you've got to spot that pattern before it disappears. And we have quite a bit of technology that can spot certain kinds of patterns rather fast. By that, I mean within 100 nanoseconds, 200 nanoseconds. But the kind of dark matter patterns that some of these theories predict, we do not have the technology to process all that information. You saw how busy that event was. And the LHC events are 100 times busier. They're going to be 100 times busier. So we can't process that much information in an image that fast in 100 nanoseconds. Uh, the computers we are running now are factors of 1,000 too slow. The electronics we are running right now is like a factor of 100 too slow. So I'm trying to make some electronics designs work out which will work so fast that we could capture those signatures, specifically some dark matter signatures at the LHC. So my bet is that this thing may be pointing to a theory that actually has the dark matter production signature in it, uh, which would explain how the dark matter got produced in the first place. But more than that, it makes a prediction. This is how the dark matter could be observable at the LHC. And that's my bet, that if my gadget works out, we could deploy it at the LHC, observe that direct signature, uh, that would be fantastic, right? Then, then that theory would be borne out and I'll be happy that my gadget actually worked. <laughs> That's as an aside. But those are my two bets. Uh, an additional Higgs, maybe more, but at least that. And something that, uh, that predicts how the dark matter got, got observed in the universe explains this W boson uh, mass discrepancy and maybe a few of the other anomalies too. I didn't mention any of those, but the more the merrier. Uh, but I'll That's bet on dark matter, I'll bet on Higgs. That's beautiful. A second Higgs and the dark particle. Yeah, <laughs> at least one, at least one. At least more. one. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful work. Most theories, when they try to predict at least one more thing, end up predicting more than at least one thing. So it could be that we are seeing like the tip of the iceberg, that you need one or two more things to explain the, M, the W boson mass, but that explanation is incomplete unless it also has number three and number four and number five because of the mathematical logic. So that is nice because then that gives you additional predictions to go for. And then, then you see the big picture. Thank you. Beautiful work. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Doctor, for this. Uh, uh, it's quite a treat. 
it's uh, quite experience. Thank you so much for wonderful. Thank you. The Happy beautiful night. slides. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, so this, uh, I, I think for first, first of all, I want to acknowledge the you know clubhouse <laughs> and the science society colleagues that bring make this uh, possible, which is uh, definitely not possible before. I mean, for the very frontier, you know, uh, particle physics science happening only a few weeks. I mean, uh, very recently, and now you know, audience around the world can you know interact with you. Uh, frontier scientists. Thank you. And uh, my, uh, I, I have a, a quite a few, but uh, let me just uh, uh, ask one and uh, uh, ask more uh, at the later stage if there's more time. So, sure. uh, the um, uh, uh, regarding the because when when the news uh, first out, uh, I actually uh, went through uh, at a, a a few occasions to to look at the science paper itself, I do see that you have that slides as well at towards the end uh, of your uh, uh, no, uh, PPT that uh, I believe is uh, 101, the uh, 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 compares with the previous. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so so measurement. So uh, my question is the, uh, I mean, before you come here, I ask elsewhere as well. I mean, in your slides provide very detailed answer how you have that uh, very narrow error bar, which is, you know, really, uh, 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 really, really, really congratulations, you know. Upon the, but the, uh, overall, so is it true, safe to say that uh, uh, given the timeline, the progression of technology that uh, the CDF, your group's measurement shall uh, have a naturally have a uh, be more uh, we can put more confidence in you know, because due to the progression of the technology or uh, since the, I do see there's uh, CL L3 there uh, there means very I mean uh, with a large error bar they're very much towards the left right so That's right. Uh, yeah and also for the future uh, I do hear that uh, somehow the C CDF uh, uh, apparatus won't uh, is not continuing, right? So, Correct. what uh, would be your uh, say? You, I, I hear you mentioned that I actually uh, see that you you, this, um, you can test your uh, next uh, uh, dark matter. So, L L L LHC is one. Then, uh, any any other uh, like uh, plants in CDF itself or elsewhere that are. Uh, Along this line, you know, would you be able to share with us? Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for that nice question. So, for everybody else, I think Dennis, you're referring to slide 101, which is in the paper as well. Oh, this is Frank. Which oh. is. Oh, sorry. There are two mics here. Oh, this is Frank. Okay. Sorry, Frank. Um, so, for everybody else, if you like, go to slide 101 and you'll see the picture Frank is referring to. This is figure five from the paper. It's on slide 101 here, showing this measurement at the bottom there with a small error bar and the previous ones. And you see some scatter. Sometimes people have been close in the past to this one, sometimes not so close. As Frank pointed out, L3 is the one that's furthest away, way to the left. So all kinds of techniques, the first four on the picture, so uh, not the first four, Delphi, L3, Opal, Aleph. These four were done in the late 1990s, early 2000s at a different kind of collider. Uh, this was an electron positron collider running at CERN. And they had preliminary numbers in 2004. Then they produced an updated set of numbers in 2007 or so. I have a bit of an interest in figuring out something changed in their result. So this is in the public record, in the scientific record, that in 2004, the combination of these four experiments, including L3, their result was substantially higher than what they are showing now. And it was rather close to this CDF number. In other words, not so precisely, but a discrepancy of this size was observed in the past, but the error was too big, so it couldn't be definitive. 
then something changed and i'm not sure exactly what i was not involved in those groups at all uh, the their experiments had also stopped running so it was just some analysis change i guess and some of the experiments changed their answer and moved it down and l3 was one of the ones that moved their result down and that was the republished with a lower number so not sure what more to say about it but there was a time when the l3 number and the other numbers were higher and then they moved down so i'd like to understand myself from talking to those people now what change did they make let's think about it then you see some of the other experiments and some of them in fact have been higher than the cdf number some lower um this is a long story with every one of them uh, uh, what, I'm not sure how much detail to go into. Some people have stopped analyzing, for example, the Dizur experiment has stopped analyzing long ago, 10 years ago. They said that their detector was damaged by the radiation in this environment. And so the damaged radiation damage sensors are not, so the technology has degraded and they are not able to do it. So unfortunately we won't get improved measurements from from D0 because the detector has been damaged. The Atlas experiment has on, has published once. Uh, people keep learning. I know I have learned over 27 years, made my share of mistakes, uh, reported every mistake uh, in every paper, and so things change. So I do know, or maybe it's not public knowledge, I'm not sure. People are reanalyzing. You know, our measurement has given people food for thought to go back not only think about how to do it better in the future but also go back to things that have been done in the past and just revise you know re-scrutinize what were the choices made what calculations were done how were they done what technique was used so the scientific scrutiny is happening not only of our result by other people i'm going to be checking our own answer just look for some things uh, try better calculations actually uh, maybe come out with a small update other people will scrutinize us, will scrutinize themselves. So that's the vibrancy of science, right? Every one of these things, we go back and check what has happened. And this is not just in MW. There is a history of other precision measurements. And you mentioned technology. So people are doing experiments a particular way. Somebody comes up with a better idea. Then suddenly the answer comes out different. People say, well, what happened? It used to be this answer, now suddenly you're claiming a different answer. Everybody goes back, does experiments again, things get scrutinized and people say, ah, okay. This is the reason there was a problem in the past. This is the better way of doing it and the future experiments are now confirming, well, maybe. So we will have to let time take its course and see what the entire field generates in terms of new ideas, new scrutiny, better ways of doing this. It is true, one of the things you said, CDF and the accelerator at the Fermi lab, which was used to produce the data, that particular experiment and that particular accelerator has been shut down. Fermi lab is now moved on to neutrino physics and not this kind of physics for the time being, 10 years, 20 years actually. So we won't have a chance to repeat this at Fermi lab. We do have a chance to try similar techniques at CERN with the ATLAS. And there's one other experiment, uh, two other experiments at CERN now, which can try to do this. CMS has not analyzed yet. They have not published yet. That's why you don't see it on the chart, but they are working on it. So let's wait for that. There is another experiment called LHCb which really is designed for bottom quark physics, not for this measurement. But in all, with all due respect, they're trying to do this measurement as well. They have produced one measurement with a very large error bar, so very low precision. But they may try to improve that as well, so we have to wait and see. But Atlas will redo it and CMS will do it. I know they're working on it and LHCb will do it again, I think. So people learn from each other and, and you know, technology gets used in a better way. Uh, 
so my prediction for where this measurement is headed is nothing more left from the Fermilab side to contribute to this. That accelerator has come and gone for now. The CERN experiments can redo this, but you've noticed how long it takes to figure out this little detail and that little detail. So the amount of time this has been done at the Tevatron is much more than the amount of time it has been done at the LLC. So in all fairness, you know, the time for the LLC analysis, we have to give it that time so that it's done carefully. So just let's just wait for it. Last word. For other reasons, Higgs, dark matter, other mysteries, things are being discussed about the next type of collider, the next type of accelerator for exploring dark matter mystery and supersymmetry and the additional Higgs and many other things. We don't know exactly what new kind of collider that will be, but most likely it will again be an electron positron collider of two different technologies. One is straight line accelerator and the other is a circular accelerator and each has its advantages and disadvantages. So the field is actually discussing ideas, new technologies like this in the US, at CERN, actually in Japan, in China. Worldwide, there are groups proposing the next type of collider beyond the Large Hadron Collider. Some of those technologies are absolutely ideal unfortunately not around the corner, but a little while in the future. Some of those technologies are absolutely ideal for making the, the absolute best, very high precision measurement of MW. It won't be soon, but I think it will happen sometime in our future. So, so that would be the final word on MW itself. Now, I'd like to believe that the clues we are getting to the new physics from this measurement, hopefully the clues will show up as direct manifestations of dark matter or additional Higgs or something else in one of the running experiments in the next 10 to 15 years. So hopefully we don't have to wait 20 years for some super high precision thing that the, the theories we are exploring now, you know, there are other predictions for other particles those will be found sooner than that. Then you'll check your favorite theory with those predictions with this MW and you'll see, aha, you know, the clue we were getting from this MW is the one that showed up at the LHC over there. And now the new picture is starting to form. My hope is that that's the way things will work out sooner than later. <laughs> Let's see. Wow. Well. Thank you, for, thank you for this uh, uh, panorama view of uh, that. This shows it's exemplary that it, uh, what you shared. Like uh, the, uh, although it, uh, of course it's fun for first physicists, scientists. Uh, it, it also shows that how hard to make a, a dent, you know, in, in this uh, uh, realm of. Uh, yeah. Science. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It, you know, it's one of those things. You're the fantastic success of building the standard model theory and finding all its experimental components and putting it all together. The success of this theory is automatically making it a lot of hard work to go beyond this theory. It, it works so well for so many things that when it doesn't work on a few things like this MW or existence of dark matter or something, finding that phenomena which takes you beyond the standard model is just that much harder because the standard model works so well. <laughs> it's like you're a, you're a victim of your own success kind of thing, right? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. Uh, and, the, and the technology we need to create the next accelerator is our current accelerators that work so well producing all this stuff Everything that works well, you know, it's hard to do much better than something that already works so well. But that's what we are here for, right? Find the next technology that will produce the next accelerator for a reasonable price. It won't be cheap, 
but we are trying to get it done for a reasonable price, which means some billions of dollars, not cheaper than that, but some billions of dollars. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, for this answer. And um, it's kind of the the ball like in the on the side of the the theoretical physicists now uh, to kind of um, remake the model. Do you think this, if this data set maybe gets um, confirmed, let's say by um, you know, getting the same result again. The, yes. What What will happen to the standard model? Aha. Uh -huh. So the theorists, of course, have been busy. Results like this really, really kick or uh, jumpstart, I would say, that whole theory community, as you can see from the citations piling up. But Extensions of the standard model have already been proposed for a long time, literally decades. Even before the Higgs was found and the standard model itself was sort of completely checked out, Higgs was the last piece. Even before that, you know, theorists are very, very smart. They already were saying, even if the Higgs is found, that would check this part of the standard model. What about the fact that it doesn't predict dark matter? What about the fact that it doesn't explain this about the Higgs? What about the fact that it doesn't explain the, the matter excess? What about the fact that there is some other mysterious assumption in the standard model? The assumption is working, but we don't understand how it works. There's got to be a better reason for this, a better reason for that. So this has been going on. So there's a plethora of theories already in the literature which are called standard model extensions. The standard model is part of a bigger framework. So they extend the theory by adding more forces here, more matter there. And some of that is dark matter and some of that explains this, some of that explains that. So the name of the game is, is more like which of all those ideas already around. Now, of course, there can be even more ideas. I'm sure people come up with even more ideas than the 50 ideas that are already there. But it might be that we have to work hard on the experimental side to choose the correct idea from all of the ones. So this MW, and presumably it's confirmation and all of this, is going to say, look, all you guys have you know, 100 or 50 new ideas out there. You've had them for a while. You're continuously producing more ideas. That's great. But let's start selecting. So this MW already throws away half of those ideas or two thirds of those ideas. I don't know how many, because those can't explain this. So now you are a, at a smaller subset. And then you say, oh, but I see one more interesting thing that doesn't fit in the standard model. Some additional ideas will get excluded from that. So I'm guessing it will be like a filter down process of all the ideas out there and the new ones that are showing up, some fraction will get excluded by this measurement, some more will get excluded by some other measurement. And so eventually we'll narrow it down to the next standard model expansion, which is closer and closer to the right one. It will be a filter down process, I think because so many ideas extending the standard model are already present. That doesn't mean any one of those has to be right. <laughs> uh, all those new brilliant ideas may all be wrong and there's yet another idea waiting for somebody to be thinking about. The history can give us a guide. My, my sense of history is this was always true. People were spinning brilliant ideas all the time. It's not like the only idea that ever came up was the standard model ideas. There were so many alternatives all the time. It's, history is full of them. It was the data that was constantly guiding them and saying, no, no, that idea, no, that can't be right. Look at the data. You, you've got to describe what the experimentalists are measuring. So 
that's what needs to happen. I think the answer to your question is the more such measurements or observations from the LHC here, there, wherever show up, the more it's going to help pin down the next, shall I say, the extension of the standard model, which encapsulates the standard model plus the other things. We need more data. It's harder and harder to come up with data. People talk about the glory days in the 60s. Every new accelerator was producing so much new measurements. Every five years, you would get a bunch of new phenomena which you couldn't explain. And so the theorists would say, ah, now I've got to explain this, this, and this. I've got three more puzzles. That's going to help me make the new theory. The entire standard model development was guided by a lot of new data showing up much more frequently, every five years. Now it's 10 years, 15 years. The accelerators are harder and harder to make. The experiments are harder and harder to build. Um, so the new data doesn't show up every five years. I mean, this MW has shown up 10 years after the last big thing, which was the Higgs discovery. That was 20 years after the previous big thing, which was the top quark discovery. So you see, we are getting into the decade time frame. <laughs> and such is the nature of life. Yeah, that is so interesting. Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't really consciously, consciously think about it because, you know, in neuroscience and all these other areas, like there's more and more, I feel like you cannot even, we could have rooms every few seconds like this. <laughs> Yes. All the data that is coming out. That's but... correct. That yes. correct. Well, yeah, like... you're, you're lucky. I mean, as I said, the field of complexity, neuroscience is one of them, so many other things. The data, especially these days with the web technology, everything, right? the data on complex systems is coming around much more rapidly. So that's fantastic. For our field, data are not coming around as rapidly because we are looking for rarer and rarer processes, which are, all, the reason they're rare is they're all active at higher and higher energies. So they were all active at the time of the Big Bang. They were crucial to formulate the, the universe as we are today. We, that's the reason the universe is the way it is today. But many of those processes are not active at the low energies at which we live. They're only active at high energies. So it's the high energy probing, which is not easy, which takes time and new technology to build. So our field is on a slower time scale now than something like yours. So you should enjoy the fact that you're getting data faster than you can explain. It, it, it's a wonderful thing to, to have. I wish we had that, but that's okay. Be a patient. Yeah, I expect great things in neuroscience. Uh, I told one student of mine, if there was a way to you know, think of another field I would be working on, I think it would be brain science. It's in the regime of complexity. When you make an extremely complex system out of simple things, all kinds of wonderful things happen, right? Which is what you're doing. Yeah, that field, and I, we had the um, microbiome talk earlier and also previously. I think um, that field will also explode with the ability to, uh, to, you know, to calculate more complex data because we still don't know about all this interaction between all these microorganisms and how right. important they are for our life. So. I think that field will explode maybe even more, which is interesting. Correct. And another thing that's helping you, I suspect, is computational power is growing too rapidly. So yeah. <laughs> that's another good thing in your favor. Yeah, because we also need we also need growing computational power. In fact, computational power is not growing fast enough for us. We can't analyze the data fast enough actually already at the LHC. 
in the future that's going to be an even bigger issue yeah i my when i did my masters in germany my professor showed me when they had to print out all the um, the action potentials of neurons and like count them by hand basically so i see wow <laughs> and, and and calculate how many milliseconds you know inhibitory excitatory work. so you know we went from printing into that we can have now thousands of um little electrodes in the brain and and compute them at the same time in I don't know, 30 years, I guess. So that's, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's a very big thing. Electrodes in the brain. I'm always amazed. All the fun stuff people do, like take data on a living neural system. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But I think um, Eli, maybe Dennis, um, Dr. Yang and Nick, um, did you have questions? I did not have a question. There is so much in this discussion. I wanted to just say, great job taking us from like outer space into the core of the planet and then like <laughs> everywhere around and making everything like relational. That's a uh, that was really a special storytelling. So I just want to say thank you for that. Yeah. Happy to do it. Glad you liked it. Okay. I know it's, if it's a fun story to hear, then I can tell you it's an even more fun story to tell. It really is. It, all these things that seem disparate when you start to see sort of how nature really is, there's one nature and it, it shows up here, there, and the things you thought were disconnected are all having a common cause. You know, somebody was asking me how, when I was five years old or something, why would you get into science? If you ever get that feeling sometime, these things are all connected. I just love to figure out what the connections are. Then, then there's nothing as much fun as science. It's like a detective story, right? I completely agree with you. Science the, is, is so much fun. <laughs> it's just like a detective. We all love reading detective stories, right? Yeah. The thing is, okay. you can't oh, flip to the last page, right? That's the one thing here. You can't flip to the last page and last page and say, who did it? <laughs> you just have to patiently work through it. So, so I, I have... A... Oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Dr. Young. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for excellent talk and the question and answers. Uh, I, so I just mentioned the size of uh, the volume. So when you talk about the uh, the boson has a volume, uh, volume has a mass, and how it in this uh, related to its size, uh, its size, like uh, given the sizes, given the particles, etc. Sorry, Dr. Yang, um, what was your yeah, question? The question is, yeah, the question is that you mentioned that the boson must have a volume, right? No, or space. Fermion. fermions have volume. So, okay, fermion Bosons has a volume. volume. Only fermions Boson have volume. Boson doesn't have a volume. No, bosons don't have volume. Uh, then... The, so the boson might have a mass, right? Except yes. uh, uh, photon. Uh, if it has a mass, why it doesn't have? Uh, okay, so let me back a little bit. Is boson has a size too? Uh, no, no, does not have a size. Um, what about the photon? No. Photon is a boson and does not have a size. Yeah, but some uh, some of um, article mentioned the photon size as 0.5 times uh, uh, 10 to minus 15 meters. 
is that a, a, a approximate or is actually accurate or is simply oh, sorry maybe i misheard you did you say photon p h o t o n yeah or did you say proton yeah come Proton has a, a size and a volume definitely. So I'm talking about a photon. P H E O T O N. Photon. Yeah. Do, do you mean the wavelength? That's what yeah, I yeah, sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's different. That's different. Uh, photon is belongs to uh, boson, right? Yes. So you say it doesn't have a size and a volume? That's okay. I so I think my question is should uh, separate for the two or three. The first question is is about the sizes of the uh, elementary particles, right? So um, so we know electron has a size about uh, ten to minus eighteen meters, right? No. No. Okay. No. So is the electron has a, a size? No. No size electron, no. but okay. why there are so many, so uh, many in the picture, so many was, like. Uh, um, Eli was waiting for a while to ask a question, and then we have Nick, and then it's, it's about okay. to come back. You want me to come back to ask you a question? Because this uh, is a very interesting question. So l let me try to answer that question quickly. Then you can think about my answer, and like, we can circle back. It, it all yes. depends on what you mean by size. So point, you know, elementary particles do not have a size in the same sense that a proton has size, that it has a boundary. This The proton is inside a certain ball, outside is not a proton, inside is a proton. So size implies some kind of a, a wall and the thing is inside and nothing is outside. So that's what a size means in, in this kind. So, in that sense, a composite object like a proton, P-R-O-T-O-N, does have a size, but the elementary particles, electron, photon, Higgs, W, there is nothing inside them as far as we know, so they do not have a size in that sense. Okay? But wavelength is a different thing altogether. So if somebody tells you that the photon of a certain frequency has a certain wavelength, that does not mean or does not have the interpretation that the photon has a size. Now for the electron, I think when you said 10 to the minus 18, you are quoting an experimental bound that if the electron had a size, in other words, if the electron was composite, was made up of something, and so therefore it did have a size, then experimentally we know that the size has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that doesn't prove that it has a size. It only says if there was a size, it's smaller than this. That's the 10 to the minus 18, I think, because I had a paper on this. I made a measurement and we could not, how do you say this? We think the electron is point-like to all experimental probes, the electron appears to be point-like. And that means if it had a size more than 10 to the minus 18, we would have observed the size. Because we do not observe any size, the size must be less than something. And it's less than 10 to the minus 18. That, that's the way to interpret that 10 to the minus 18 for the electron. It's either point like or it's less than 10 to the minus 18. It's not bigger than that. Huh? So, so the following question is uh, the Maybe size is, a, is. You want to think about that while I circle back? Let, let's take some other questions and I'll circle back. I, I can. Okay. Stay as, yeah, I can stay as long as you like. So, so this is a little bit of a dart dart throw on you know your your supposition that uh, uh, there there might be uh, more uh, Higgs like particles, um, and I you know this is probably totally off, but I, I was just reminded of how in in 
um, other uh, approaches to solving uh, um, the wave function just in, in regular quantum mechanics. Um, by, by essentially doing recurrent double differentiation, you can get increasing accuracy. And an you know, example of this is, is uh, um, uh, molar placet uh, calculations. And I'm wondering if perhaps something like, okay, when, when you are doing these experiments, you're doing an observation, right? Yes. Which means a collapse of a wave function. Yes. But that only tells you about the measurements that you are likely to make, you know, over the number of me measurements that you made, right? Yeah. And so what I'm, what I'm kind of just, it, it's kind of a tantalizing uh, notion that perhaps you could have a distribution of, you know, multiples of your measured mass, right, that fall off, but when you integrate over all of them, you get the, essentially the energy that, or the, the total mass that you would be missing. Okay. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, I would like your thoughts. You can tell me it makes no sense. <laughs> um... See, <laughs> Let, let me try to answer this way. Every concept that we are referring to, uh, we were talking about size, now we are referring to mass. The concept makes sense in a particular context. So, and typically the context is you are writing down a particular equation. You are going to say how that equation describes a particular set of phenomena in nature. And the, the equation itself has some term here, some term there. And when you put that term here, there, there, and crank the whole equation, and you get some numerical answer for a particular observable, then when you do go the experiment, you get the same value of the observable. Then you say the equation works. So when we talk about the mass of the W boson or the size of something, blah, blah. blah none of those things have like some meaning detached from the context in which it's used, right? So when we talk about the W boson, it has this long story associated with it. What exactly do you mean? Is it this quantity in this equation, which then describes that observable and so on? When you put it in that context, the MW is a number not a distribution. You see what I mean? Uh, okay, well, okay, so, so it, it's a number certainly within, within the statistical error. Um, what, what? Um... Ah, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. So statistical error is a measurement concept, right? It's, it's because the observable that you have, yeah. that observable itself is coming from a quantum process, which is by its very nature probabilistic. So every observable, every parameter in the quantum theory, when it comes through the equations of quantum and eventually manifest in nature, in nature is always manifested as a probabilistic observable. So therefore I have to average over a lot of observable observations in order to infer what that number is. So in nature, it's an actual number, not a distribution. But the experiments are probabilistic manifestations of that number. See what I mean? Uh, yes, yes, I do. I'm, 
Um, so, so I guess like a different analogy for what I, what I was thinking of, um, is, uh, in, 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 um, wave function calculations, uh, you, you can do, uh, you know, standard Hartree-Fock calculation, right? And you get yeah. the, the energies of various orbitals, but, but that, that is, that is just an approximation. Correct. However, if you take into account basically some of these further terms some of the important further terms in many situations are things like configuration interactions in other words the the extent of the wave function wave functions of the individual particles in the total wave function um at in different configurations which actually affects what you would measure that's that's a different way, kind of roundabout of of getting at what I was trying to say before. Ah, I think you are referring to how the sort of parameters of the theory changes because you change the rules of the theory. You make the theory more accurate, or add additional components. The expansion of terms. The expansion of terms. Okay, so it's a perturbative expansion, or it's some expansion in which you are making successively more accurate approximations to reality. Then well, f f factoring, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, or summing, you know, additional configurations that the system could possibly be in. But, you know, most of these configurations are just rare and unimportant, right? But there are a lot of them. So when you sum over all of them, Correct. sometimes that will make a difference. A long tail. Yes. Yes. So it, it will make a difference to a particular prediction, right? So you're trying to predict some observable at the end of the day. Then that observable will have a different value or a different distribution or something because of your prediction becoming more accurate because the prediction is an average over some set of configurations. So uh, if you're saying that therefore the parameters of the theory are modified as your calculation becomes more accurate, the answer is yes, indeed. But, but somehow that to me is not a distribution of parameter values, right? For any particular calculation you do, there is a particular parameter value which will describe the real world the best possible. Okay, yeah, it's it's where you're trying. I mean, the difference is is not the parameters, but where you're truncating uh, the terms that you decide are no longer significant. Fine. Okay. Okay. So th there is an analog of that in our sense. That is, when we make the standard, when somebody makes a standard model calculation and gets that particular number, they are also truncating. Nobody knows how to do that calculation exactly because it's again a, a series, a mathematical series, a perturbation series, and they have to drop. They can only calculate terms up to some point beyond which it, the calculation accuracy is not there. So you truncate the calculation there and you hope it's good enough. And then you try to estimate what happens if you try to do the calculation a little more accurately. In your words, add more configurations, actually. It's a fair way of describing it. Then the calculation becomes a little more accurate. And this calculated value of MW becomes a bit more accurate, too. So our calculated value is becoming more and more accurate. But in some sense, in nature, there is only one number. Our estimate of that number is becoming more accurate. Okay, yeah, and, and and I did notice that that you know it, it was for uh, uh, MEV, you know, in theory and and in measurement error, in Correct. theoretical error and measurement error, which which is, is a beautiful uh, result, you know, I absolutely uh, uh, congratulate you on <laughs> that. You. Um, uh, but I, I guess what what I'm I'm getting at is, um, you know, if if uh, you can have it not be strictly 
a converging trend, you know, as, as, as you add more terms, but, but, you know, you, you could instead think, think, think of, of the expansion as a wave function and there are actually nodes, right? It, in, in, in the trend uh, so that it's not regular. And uh, you know the possibility that that the the additional Higgs that you implied might might be uh, in 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 that part of the distribution. In other words, beyond where you've truncated. Mm. That question, I think, has been studied quite carefully by the people who do the calculations the level at which the calculations are being done now in comparison to the large scale effect manifested by an additional Higgs. I think the jury is in on that, which is the new phenomena people are postulating like an additional Higgs has way larger a physical manifestation than the small effect because of the truncation or the configurations being averaged over and the configurations which are being ignored, that the small effect because of that, so people try to investigate whether that effect is truly really small or could it be as big as the entire effect because of a new Higgs. And I think many of these things, I can't speak for all of them, but in large part, people are quite confident having explored those configuration things that a completely new ingredient like an additional Higgs has a much bigger effect than the little effect because of the missing configurations. I mean, that's an excellent question which people have to ask first. But for many of these things, that question has been asked. And I think to the satisfaction of multiple of groups, been answered satisfactorily. Every once in a while, what you're saying is always happening. Somebody says, I want to put in a new physics thing and somebody else says, but wait, some previous calculation without the new physics was being done. How accurately was that done? Were there some missing configurations that are as important as the new physics? It's in fact, a quite a relevant point you bring up because there is something in the uh, in our world called the g minus 2 maybe you've heard about it last year there was a result it's a particular measurement of a property of the muon which is quite interesting to measure accurately it's got some difference the measurement and the calculation have some difference but the calculation has the same exact thing you're talking about some configurations included others not included People are now asking the question, what about the excluded configurations? Could they have an effect as large as the so-called new physics? In which case you're misleading yourself. There is no new physics. It's just the missing configurations you should have included in the first place. So every once in a while that worry shows up and it gets tracked down. So this one is actually an active field. <laughs> so, so what I want to say is most of the time you are point is checked out and doesn't turn out to be you know, relevant. But every once in a while, it turns out to be quite relevant. And then people have to say, all right, we got to do some more work. All those missing configurations have to be included. So so, so thanks for that. I, the, the thing that, that uh, uh, immediately follows, though, so if, if there is an additional Higgs, um, I, I, this is a question, would it necessarily have to be rare compared to the Higgs that, that has been pinned down in order not to greatly perturb all of the interactions which have been rationalized in terms of, of the Higgs which has been, been pinned down. Yeah, so rare, here's how it works. The properties of the additional Higgs would have to be such. It doesn't actually have to be rare. <laughs> it's a very good question. Its properties have to be such that all the observables that led to the existing Higgs, that particular set of observables is not modified 
by the existence of the second Higgs. So it, it's nature engineering itself in a particular way that says the combination of the two Higgses in reality has the same physical effect as a simpler theory with a single Higgs. Yeah? So Higgs one plus Higgs two in nature produces an observable. Our theory starts with a single Higgs, produces a calculation of an observable. The single Higgs theory gets tuned with some number here and some number there to match the observable of nature. So you say, ah, oh, my single Higgs theory just works fine. It turns out that the two Higgs theory in nature is conspiring to produce the same observable. So the single Higgs was sort of working by a very interesting accident for observable and, A, for observable B, for observable C. And those are the observables you knew so far. So you said, oh, good, I'm done with the single Higgs. I don't need any more. Until you see observable D. And observable D says, aha, D is different. A single Higgs would give you a different answer and two Higgs would give you a different answer. Nobody ever thought about measuring observable D. And then somebody says and goes and sees observable D and says, what? This is different from a single Higgs. It wasn't a rare observable. It's sometimes it's rare. So you're right. You know, sometimes it's rare. So nobody could find it. But sometimes it's that nobody thought about it. The history of science is often like that. It was there all along, just nobody thought about looking there. And that one is the one that tells the difference between single hex and two hexes. So, so I, I just look forward to, to when we get to call those calculations lumped Higgs cal yeah. calculations. It's quite often happened that way. People just look in a different place and there's a smoking gun there that the previous calculation that was working to describe observable A, B, C, D, the, the observable, the next observable that shows them wasn't really rare. It just, nobody thought about looking there. And sometimes it was staring you in the face. If you had looked at it earlier, you would have found it earlier. Quite often that has to do with the experimentalist's instinct, right? Where is the next clue hiding? It could be right in front of my nose. I just, I'm not looking there. It's a decent analogy for some of the things that have happened in our field. Yeah, so, so th thanks for answering my question. Yeah. I yeah. really enjoyed this. Okay, there was. Nick. I think I think Nick has the question. We can. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, sure. You you're probably exhausted by talking almost two hours. Um, well, I've had some I've... lectures in class running longer. Don't worry. I have two questions, but uh, I'm uh, because of the in, in the interest of time, I wonder which of the two I should select to ask you, because I have to choose it at this point. I guess I'm going to grab one of them. So um, one way to increase, one way to work on in particle physics to um, increase the, so to speak, the effectiveness of the machinery. I call it machinery accelerators and so on to create more and more and more and more higher and higher and higher energies. Yes. However, the other way around is to increase the precision of measurement. Yes. So, so these are two things you can achieve the, probably the same results. My question, my first question is, I get the feeling by, by listening to people and so on and so forth, the fact that the LHC did not discover supersymmetry or any of the other things they were hoping to, to discover. Although the, the discovery of the Higgs is huge to me, but yes. anyway, they, yep. people are talking about crisis in high energy well, physics. Yeah. And uh, so some people are saying, 
instead of building this uh, future um, larger and more energetic uh, accelerators, why don't we go into a different direction to start increasing the precision of me measurements? Like uh, take it to the, you know, the 15th after the decimal point. Um, so my question is, do you agree that uh, this, I mean, do you, you're a professor. My, uh, are they, is particle physics, is high energy physics, a hot field right now, which attracts people or not? I mean, I ask here several questions and I apologize. Uh, but anyway. Okay. Um, let me start by the last point first. Is it a hot field? Um, the, huh. There is a sense about when people talk about hot field and this, that, and crisis, somehow it is trying to put science in the same description as a fashion show. What is fashionable? What is easy? What is how? Where is it easy to get excitement? Right? Uh, stuff like this. Now, we we are trying to unravel nature. So is nature sitting there waiting to excite us? I don't think nature is sitting around trying to make human beings excited or get out of depression or anything like this. So. Any comment about the fashionableness or hotness or crisisness? Somehow they all seem to me missing the point. You are not trying to do science because you enjoy discovering the next mystery. I, I'd like to give the analogy of a treasure hunt. If you're a treasure hunter, are you doing it just to find the treasure at the end, which means that's the only moment you enjoy? Suppose the treasure hunt takes 10 years and it takes you following 20 clues. Do you enjoy following the clues or do you only enjoy the moment when, the, when you dig the treasure out, which is one second out of 20 years, right, or 10 years? My answer is if you're a treasure hunter, who knows if in your lifetime you'll find this treasure, how many treasures you'll find, but you're doing it because the following the clues day to day, you know, in the grind is itself hot. It's itself exciting. So to me, making the LHC work, making its energy, whatever it is, you know, seven times more than the previous accelerator, getting its data rate to increase by a factor of 10. Every time you do this, you're letting, you know, you're giving nature an opportunity to reveal something. It doesn't mean that nature owes you something, that just because you made the effort, nature has to deliver. I mean, nature doesn't have to do anything. So our psychological uh, needs, you know, are not part of the equation as scientists. So to me, anybody who writes, you know, I've been waiting for the next discovery from the LHC and I'm depressed because nature hasn't found anything for me, makes me say something like, what? You are more important and and somehow nature is is, is, is meant to please you because you need emotional excitement. Uh, if that's what you need, you know, don't read science. Watch, watch TV movies or something. That will give you as much excitement as you like. So that's, I mean, it's not a nice answer, right? But it's the answer I really feel to any comment about the depression and the crisis about LHC not discovering uh, all this kind of stuff. Now, the, the actual fact that scientifically the ideas of supersymmetry or this idea or that idea, the way those ideas were propagated 
were meant to be solutions to particular puzzles. The standard model has this puzzle and that puzzle and that puzzle, and so you have to solve those puzzles. So these ideas were the solutions to those puzzles. Now, if those solutions aren't manifesting at the LHC, that means the actual solution to those puzzles is something else. So what is that correct solution we are here to find? And maybe we are getting a clue from this MW what the correct solution is, or at least which subset of the solutions is correct and which is wrong. So whatever the correct solution is, we haven't looked for it so far correctly. It may still be in the LHC data. We just haven't analyzed the LHC data in the correct way. That's easily possible. Or the correct solution requires an energy uh, for the collider, which is slightly higher than the LHC energy. Or maybe it requires an electron-positron collider, which has certain benefits compared to a proton-proton collider. So every one of these things is a bet that the correct solution you're looking for is within the scope of that collider and within the analysis that you do. And if you don't happen to hit the right combination, uh, it's not the LHC fault, it's the luck of the draw. It's like saying, if I want to find America, how far do I have to go? If I go 200 miles away from Spain, if I go 400 miles away from Spain, if I go 800 miles away from Spain, what? You're gonna turn back and say, I'm so disappointed and depressed that there is a crisis, that America hasn't shown up. Well, it happened to be 3000 miles. You just didn't go that far, right? And eventually somebody did. So I don't think any puzzles in the past showed up, you know, solutions showed up easily and they don't have to show up easily in the future. The puzzles are still there. I think yeah. the excitement is in the fact that the puzzles exist. I don't think a field becomes boring because you don't find the answers quickly or easily. I think a field is boring if there are no questions. But when all the questions get answered completely and no more questions are there, then the field is done. So, we, just because the answers haven't shown up in the last 10 years doesn't mean the field is done. Yeah, so, yeah. thank you so much. I think, um, yeah, it's time to kind of wrap up. We, we've been going for yeah, quite a while, right? For a while. And I think this was a beautiful ending, what you said, that, you know, the adventure of solving puzzles it's like the curiosity is what drive us and the good news is we have still uh so many problems to solve <laughs> and, and um and so we we keep going and we can in theory if re uh, rejuvenation brings us a little bit more years we can keep solving puzzles <laughs> or the next generation yeah. And, you know, historically, see, two things. A, the puzzles exist. They're extremely interesting puzzles. B, the technology required to solve the puzzles to take it to the next step. Developing that technology is a lot of fun. I think you were asking the next generation technology for the accelerator or the next generation technology to increase the precision. Uh, I think the answer is not whether you should do one or the other. And people like to say this, stop the energy frontier and just go to the precision frontier. It's not as if you can anticipate where nature will show the next clue. This MW, people didn't expect that the precision of this will get us something. People said the LHC energy will get us something. It did get us the Higgs. And then this precision of MW was showing us the next clue. So who knows which one it will be next. It may be the energy frontier next. It may be the precision frontier next. So ideally, you just push every frontier you can to the best possible and enjoy the process of you know, sort of stepping up to the challenge, shall I say. The, the one thing we are not talking about here is cost. So let's exclude that from the conversation. If you tell I believe me, we didn't mention it, yeah. 
if you tell me the precision by a factor of 20 is cheaper to do than the energy increase by a factor of five, and you say, how much cheaper? Well, I'll tell you it's a factor of 10 cheaper. Then, of course, it's sort of clear your priorities with the money you have is invest in the precision frontier and, and wait. Wait until the energy frontier becomes cheaper. So invest in the R&D to make the energy frontier cheaper. But, but somewhere, if you say abandon one for the other, then without any statement of the cost, it's kind of a silly statement. Right? Who knows, the precision frontier by a factor of 1,000 may actually be far more expensive than the energy frontier by a factor of 10. Well, then it's the other way. It's not like precision comes for free and energy has a, has a lot of cost. It's not like that. But it does come in cycles almost on a decade. Which decade would you say we're on? Governments tend to come and prefer one versus the other, like the last decade was machine learning. Uh, would you say that uh, we're in one or the other, or if people were to want to get into this field or this direction, which one would you say they should focus on? What's hot now, as it were? Uh, a loaded question. The other guy's a particle physicist. <laughs> so, if you go question by question, suppose you want to do dark matter direct detection. Suppose you want to explore Higgs at the LHC. Um, what would be the actual technical problem you would want to solve, which would give you substantially higher sensitivity in the precision frontier over there or the energy frontier over there? That particular technical challenge requires you to invest, you know, $20 million. So you would say follow the money is what you're saying. I guess because it's big physics, you have to follow the money and see kind of where the money is spent and which one costs less, I guess, is kind of what you're hinting at maybe. Follow the science. The whole field follows the science. And so it takes a long time to understand what the science is, right? So there's no quick answer. But we all meet over and over. Everybody's thinking, what's the next best bet for the R&D to pay off? Which technology is likely to pay off? What cost will there be to invest in that technology? And then when you materialize the technology, what will be the cost of the thing? And what's the potential payoff? Um, if you don't think about all the things, then the quick answer is, yeah, follow the money because whoever is spending the money has already thought about it. So it's like somebody has done the thinking, now you follow the money because that's likely to happen. So that's the easy answer. Uh, somehow you it's not the it. best answer. I don't like that as the best answer. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not the best answer, but I was just thinking in terms of the next accelerator, it's gonna be probably built by China, which means that they already probably have pre-selected a lot of the technology advances they wanna do. So we can look at um, the uh, the recent satellite uh, or the, the dish that went down, the Arecibo, and then the Chinese replacement for that. It's generations ahead, right? And uh, so, so that's kind of, I guess the, the question was for the next decade of, of research, because I assume that the work that you discuss here is the culmination of many, many years of work, most yeah. likely the last decade. And just in my experience, governments tend to have these requests for proposals. So yes. you've kind of set the bar already. It's probably going to be a while before somebody breaks your record here, as it were. So the, 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 the question was kind of the next low hanging fruit, but I digress. Thank you for your answer. I yeah. West is a... my, my quick answer is I'm not sure there is low hanging fruit in particle physics. Yeah. That's just low hanging particles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. but there, there is supposed to be a new collider in the US. Is it on Long Island here in New York? Or did Brookhaven made it? Or was it Texas, I believe? Uh huh. One of the two are competing, but I think one of them won by now, and I think it's here in in New York, Brookhaven, that a new yes. one was built. So, so the purpose of the one in Brookhaven, which is going to get built in the next 10 years, 
it's going to collide electrons with heavy ions, lead and things like this. So the purpose of that one is to get the electron beam to probe deeply inside the lead nucleus and kind of understand what goes on deep inside the nucleus from the perspective of the strong interaction. So it's the same strong interaction that we explore at the LHC, but there we explore it at the level of individual quarks. We think we understand that com almost completely, I would say. But how you have the complex nucleus, which is not a single quark colliding with a single quark. That's what we do in particle physics. One quark on one quark, you can understand that pretty well now. But what happens when you put gazillions of quarks inside a nucleus, it's the same emergent phenomena, right? The neuroscience complexity frontier. The Burkhaven Collider is in some sense going to explore the complexity frontier of the strong interaction. So it was not quite in direct competition with the one in Texas, which did not get done. The one in Texas was the one about additional supersymmetry, Higgs, dark matter. So they were exploring different regimes. The Texas one was about reductionist approach, smaller and smaller components. The Brookhaven one is about the complexity frontier. So two ends, completely different. So they're not in competition in that sense. Now, you might say they're in competition because the money is the same, right? The government has one part of money. Well, yes and no. Uh, the, how the government works is far more complicated than what we can discuss in hours. But it seems that some governments are a little bit more organized than others. So Europe, for example, has an amazing funding program through CERN. They can basically fund anything. They just set out the timeline, right? America tends to be a little bit more precarious, and China seems to be very ambitious. Yeah, you're almost right. The U.S. system, with our four-year election cycle, you know, governments change every eight years, four years, with different priorities. Um, that's true. We have a, yeah, a more dynamical system in the U.S. with changing priorities after every four years. So that's another issue. CERN, CERN, let's remember, CERN is a very special historical place. Remember that, right? Why CERN is able to get its billion dollars a year every year? Because it's an international treaty organization between countries. The countries are always arguing, they're always fighting, they've always been fighting in the past. But it was the Second World War that somehow convinced those countries you can fight as much as you like, but in the end you better agree, otherwise you completely lose leadership, like what happened to Europe after the Second World War. So CERN grew out of the need for Europe to rebuild. And so they said, we've got to make a treaty to make an international level lab, which will again be dominant and world leading. So it was a rebuilding exercise. And every time the CERN budget comes in threatened because of all the usual governmental things, then they remember, oh my God, but remember, if we don't agree to support CERN, think of what can happen to Europe. We've achieved this leadership position and we need to keep it and no matter what the financial situation is, somehow we got to keep CERN going. So the motivation to keep CERN going is because they're always comparing to the alternative of what happens, always coming back to the history of Europe after the Second World War. That's how governments work, right? It's, it's some psychological uh, thing. So there's the same thing going on with China. They're, they're an up-and-coming economy and they want to compete on every level with everybody else. So they're looking around to see what's the biggest thing anybody has ever done so that they go down in the history books as you know, the, the country that did this. Uh, now America went to the moon for the first time and somebody did this for the first time and so everybody remembers that. So they're looking for these history book writing things which will put them in the same league. Right? So I agree with your ambitious characterization. But this is the reason governments do these things. Not the scientific curiosity that you and I may have. 
Would you say that then um, it is an appropriate strategy going forward, particularly in light of the, you know, embracing complexity to bring it back to, you know, our, the beginnings of our discussion, to have a more question-oriented or at least experimental genre focus for new colliders and, and these new um, projects. Uh, so they are non-competitive, but in some sense, symbiotic. Yeah. In a sense, I mean, it, it's sort of easy for us to say, let's not make it competitive. Because our perspective is always, there is an extremely interesting question in this field, which is reductionist or something. There's an extremely interesting question in that field and that field. And as scientists, we think they're all worth pursuing. You know, Just because you explain this mystery doesn't mean the other one is gone away. No, the other one is still there. We want to solve them all. That's our perspective as scientists. Every mystery is worth solving. Now, government will come and say, all right, you guys, it's all wonderful. We want to put 0.01% of the economy into basic science, which translates into X billion dollars. So we'll put aside X billion dollars and then you all sit together and figure out how you want to spend the X billion dollars. And we all come together and say, but our 20 mysteries are such that we need five times the X billion dollars uh, because we want to solve them all at the same time. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we, we really think you all should, but you're going to get X billion dollars. So it's not like the mysteries are in competition. But somebody says, hey, you know, I've got to build schools. I've got to worry about the water running out in California. I've got to worry about this, that. I've got 20,000 things to worry about. I can give you X billion dollars. Just do the best you can with X billion dollars. So I think you're asking a very good question, but a very hard question. Once you get a cap on the total funding, then should you put it into the complexity or into the reductionist? Ah, uh, we can talk about that forever, right? Or do you split it half and half and say X over two for you and X over two for you? Do the best you can. As uh, my quantum uh, professor said, uh, it's turtles all the way down, so. <laughs> In the end, it's the most reasonable thing to do is just divide up the money somehow. Let each field be as creative as it can to do the best it can with the money it gets. It always wants more. If you had five times more money, you could do X times more in that field. And you could say that about every field. Uh, but somebody's got to draw a line somewhere, right? Maybe you can double the science funding. Okay, because we can do everything twice as much. But you still wouldn't put it all in the complexity frontier. You wouldn't still put it all, you would not put it all in the particle physics frontier. You do the best you can with some kind of distribution of the funds. And, you know, some field will deliver more with its fraction of the money and some field will deliver less because of nature, this, that, who knows where the puzzle is hiding. And every 20 years from now, the other field will become hotter in some sense. And to me, that just means it took a long time to reach a particular discovery threshold, and then that start, field started making a whole bunch of discoveries quickly. So for some moment, it appears to be hotter, and then the other field, which has been making steady progress, eventually reaches its threshold, and suddenly it starts to make a bunch of discoveries. So every field has its thresholds after thresholds, but no field ever arrives at its threshold without all the hard work of the previous decades when it appeared to be boring. So that's my problem with this hotness thing, right? If you only you know, take what it's... is fashionable, you never actually reach a frontier which required you to do X amount of boring work or something, so-called boring work for yeah. 20 years. It's and just... I, I also think that about applied uh, science, like when you have to have a specific goal to um, find a solution for one specific thing and 
uh, and you forget about the basic signs that led to so many crucial correct things we have now you only will see maybe in 50 years i mean now it's more accelerated but you know traditionally uh, what basic science does now we will have applications uh in 50 years or so so it's kind of the life cycle but it's an interesting um question that people are asking about how to diversify the funding because it keeps going to but the same institution, sometimes even the same labs uh, over and over, and then there, there's not too much left for other labs that could have maybe good ideas and, and good um, questions to solve. But one idea I thought was really interesting, so that basically you give all the money to all the different labs distributed, and then the labs get to get a, a par part of it, but most of the part they would need to um, give to other researchers yeah. that is out of their field. I thought that was um, was a really interesting solution. Sounds like voting with your dollar for science funding. It's sort of a mix of those two things the two of you just said. It used to be like that, that from the very top level, for completely different reasons, they would fix a budget. Whatever fits politically, this, that, or the other, okay. So then you distribute that between the labs by some political agreement process, the number of users and so on, okay. The size of the infrastructure, okay. Then everybody who has an idea would approach the lab and make a physics proposal. So then a committee would sit around and say, we got 50 proposals for the $100 million out of those 50, we choose the best 10, and then each one of them gets $10 million. So the $100 million is bid for from the scientific community and let the best ideas come out through a fair and honest process of peer review. Right? So then the government says, okay, this lab got $100 million and they made sure that the best ideas got pursued with the $100 million. Not every possible idea, but the best. And what does best mean? The combination of discovery potential and the risk potential and null result versus some frontier was reached. And nobody can promise anything because it's fundamental science, right? So it's not- Say like that to the string theorists. They've been promising things for such a long time. I myself, former string theorist, yeah. I can say that for a long time, it seemed like all the cool kids only went to string theory and that was the only thing that funded and then you came out just knowing a bunch of fancy differential geometry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, people fall for fashion. That's why I don't want to get into the hot, cool, and crisis logic. It's just not the right logic. So you could say string theory was hot, 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 and now string theory is in crisis. And most string theorists are now doing other things, trying to apply their concepts to cosmology or fluids or, you know, AI seems to be a, a really uh, receptive field, so at least for the mathematical example, tools you pick up. For example, so the, the fashionableness is a bit of a problem because it somehow ends up deciding which who gets a job and who doesn't get a job, not because of their intrinsic caliber, but because of the field they're in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even, even yeah, but this is, this, this is unavoidable, I think. Uh, this is sure unavoidable. That. For example, I've noticed in the US when you look at high schools, what they teach, what science do they teach in US high schools in comparison to other countries, for example? Biology, number one. Chemistry, yeah. yes. Physics, it's an afterthought. Really yeah, an afterthought. I, when I was yes. in high school in a different country, I, I studied physics the most. So. Um, this has an impact and they say 21st century is the century of you know, neuroscience biology so on and so forth 20th century is the century of physics so you cannot <laughs> avoid fashionableness <laughs> i know i know well well I mean, so exactly, the, even know. even in terms yeah fun we often in this room in descend or ascend however you want to look at it into discussing the funding of science and how problematic it is um, even in, you know, embracing complexity, there's, 
always the aspect of applied and even the strategy to fund basic research, which is always underfunded in my view, um, there's, it hides, you know, it sometimes hides behind applications, whether there be therapeutic applications in biology or material science applications yeah. in chemistry or, you know, what, what, what's, what distinguishes physics is it's, it's such a fundamental nature that it's difficult, uh, perhaps, and, you know, comment, please, but it, it's difficult to find those applications that the basic science can hide and seek shelter from. Yeah, yeah we cannot promise. The basic science output does not and sh should not promise application. It's kind of misleading. And I think as scientists, you know, it's sort of tempting to play some political game and promise something and do something else. But in the end, it backfires. So my personal feeling is we should not play any other person's game, uh, politician's game or lawyer game or a banker game or, you know, industrialist game. The basic scientist can only promise one thing. These puzzles are extremely interesting to the best ability you, are, you have. Con convince your audience of the excitement of the puzzle. They may like it, they may not find it exciting, but you do your best. And somebody somewhere will say, yeah, I think, I think pursuing that puzzle is worth something. May not be how much funding they want, but they should have something. Somebody somewhere will stand up for us and say, these people are serious. They're not wasteful. Uh, they really believe that this is good. They will work very hard. They're not going to waste the money. So it's a good resource, right? If they think of basic scientists as a bunch of people who are in it for the science and will work hard, as hard as they can for whatever money you give them, uh, it's good to have such people in society. Somebody will say it's good to have such people in society. Maybe not a large number of them, but some number of them. So let them play their games. Maybe we'll see something interesting, maybe not, but give them a chance. So just I think some honest presentation like that will get us enough funding, which will always keep us on our toes. And so we'll never get fat. Well, and unfortunately, it, it seems the average age of principal investigators is only going up. So somebody is accepting money when perhaps they should be letting the money go to younger folks who correct. have newer ideas, right? Correct. Now, this, I think, has trickled down at least to some of our funding agencies. So particle physics, I'm not sure about other fields, but particle physics is steadily creating uh, vehicles to explicitly fund young researchers. So this outstanding jury investigate award and the NSF career award and this and that. They are, and I've been on some of these panels and there is a good feeling there. Hey guys, the, 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 your, your you know, funding agency organizer will tell the panel, by the way, we are looking for grants coming from really senior people Look for evidence that they're actually active, not that they're just senior, they're actually active. If they appear to be inactive, feel free to rank them. And the least active senior people, you know, cut their summer salary so that we can liberate X amount of money to fund grants explicitly for the juniors, right? the early career for which anybody beyond 40 is not eligible. So they are trying to take the money from <laughs> The, the old age pool and bring it to the young age pool. I think they're doing, at least NSF and Department of Energy Office of Science is actively doing this. I don't know about other funding. I, I also like there. what Eric Weinstein suggested. So for every grad student to, as an exercise and something that they would have to publish is a review of three problems or 
technical areas that in the past failed or had issues and how now reviewing them or uh, revisiting those ideas, how they fare nowadays. I thought that that was a really interesting kind of um, interesting. Okay. Uh, approach. Yeah. So do, do you, would you agree or how do you feel about that? So what, what's the sign of that comment? Look at problems. Uh, no, no. So you assign three problems in the past that failed to students now for them to review and revisit. So then they become ah. more familiar with the past. This was one of Eric Weinstein's comments because he really doesn't like string theorists. And, uh, uh, you know, they tend to take up all the oxygen in a room. And so to diversify, at least at the, you know, at the lower levels, so that people, before they kind of get dug in with their careers, that they get a sense of kind of, hey, what were ideas in the past? Where could these ideas be going, given what we know now? That sort of thing is an exercise in innovation or uh, disruption, however you'd want to phrase that. Yeah, yeah. I think you kind of see a linkage between this point you've just raised and the precision point came out in a previous conversation five minutes ago. Let me now focus, I see a connection here between the precision of the calculations. So we talked about precision of experiments, potential costs there and difficulties. There is another frontier, which is precision calculation which is suffering in the US. The Europeans are doing that. But as you say, the US particle physics theory in particular has migrated so much towards string theory for a long time. The standard model extension theories have also been cranked out for a very long time. Both of them are suffering from, suffering meaning not their choice, but luck, that the nature of the discoveries or new evidence from experiments is following a particular pace. The string theory on the what we call phenomenology, which is the new model building, hasn't had enough data, either of them, for a long time. So in that sense, I would say the US particle theory community has a bit of an organizational crisis. The way the other course community are solving it is they're saying, you know, we are skilled people at calculations. We know how to do integrals, differential geometry, uh, configuration counting, all of this is hard stuff. Instead of doing it for string theory, why don't we just do it for quantum chromodynamics and electric theory and just take the calculational accuracy of known phenomena, push it a couple of decimals further, which will help the experimentalists increase the precision of their analysis further. And maybe the new phenomena show up in the precision because the calculation is precise. The US particle physics community is not investing in that third option, which is precision calculations as much as the rest of the world is. So, this kind of ties together both with the precision question before on the theory side now, and your current point, which is the US particle physics field could do what you said. We've done all this model building for 30 years. We've done all this string theory for 30 years. What is it that we haven't done? Well, we haven't increased the precision of the standard model calculations, which the experimentalists are using. Why don't we now you know, do that for 10 years. Maybe it'll help the experimentalists. And this is not biting, and I think it should, because in some sense, it's an opportunity to use that skill set, to develop the skill set among the young people and do something useful for the field and not fall for the mentality, ah, but that's not sexy enough, or that's not hot enough only string theory is hard and only model building is hard and doing hardcore calculations at the next decimal place is not exciting enough so we don't go there that's uh, a bad choice other countries are not making that choice so they're i think doing good can uh, i ask worse. a question yeah thank you uh, thank you lady racket and uh, katarina as always appreciation for 
creating such a valuable opportunity to meet uh, unusual, important scientists. Uh, and uh, Ashutosh, I assume you are from India, so allow me to wish you uh, still pending in, in Los Angeles uh, International Independence, I mean, India Independence Day, holiday, yes. I believe. Yes, in fact, it's a very special one. It's the 75th yes. anniversary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, my team that were, yes, it's my pleasure and it's totally sincere uh, because I believe uh, very strongly that we should strengthen our scientific collaboration with India and with Indian scientists as our strategic partner. Well since said. Special, Wonderful. Yeah, I'd like to hear especially that, yeah. especially in space, and I am a space innovator. Uh, I am a space maverick investor and entrepreneur, oh, oh, uh, wow. because the time calls for us to be invisible, fearless, invincible, fearless, and do as much as we can to address some of the challenges that you have been speaking about, including financial challenge. And this is when I decided to raise my hand because you are so totally right. Uh, the limitation of the financial system uh, holds us back and beautiful point that you have made that I also want to acknowledge and endorse because it's very rarely heard uh, is a recognition that young people are frequently not able uh, to qualify um, for, for sufficiently uh, fast and innovative way of funding. So here comes my, my contribution to this subject, and I hope it's going to bring a lot of hope, excitement, and opportunities. Because as a space investor and entrepreneur, I have suffered from the same difficulties of getting funded, you know, try to finance space mission. It's, you know, you cannot go to equity fund, hedge fund, Wall Street, or, or even a venture capital. So I decided to solve this problem. And I started to work on this in 2016 by harnessing technology that I think is a great friend of scientists, technology called the blockchain technology called NFTs and tokens, but not cryptocurrency, not speculative one. But my company named after a brave scientist, Copernicus. Uh, uh -huh. My company is called Copernic Space. I am originally, I am, I've been in the States for about 40 years, but I, I, I came as a graduate student, uh, but I am originally from Poland. So this is my homage to my, my country's brave scientist. That's nice, yeah. So Copernic Space developed a platform that is creating scientific and space assets that can be offered, listen to it, because you mentioned to it also in your talk, uh, like a, appealing to the private sponsors of science. So the platform that we developed exactly is solving our problem and your problem because we created opportunity to offer space assets uh, and in our case, uh, we are already going to the moon with our mission. So our space okay. assets include, and that's the innovation, financial and pragmatic. Our client, our client called Lunar Outpost, okay. is a sci scientific uh, a company um, on the top list of NASA who developed Lunar Outpost first private moon rover and they were trapped for lack of revenues because here are the revenues and I'm sure you will identify with it. They had two sources of revenues, one NASA, one dollar. Of course, NASA gave them millions to develop it, but now I am talking about how much they are going to get paid for landing on the moon and doing uh, the wonderful stuff there. One dollar from NASA and five dollars from Nokia, who is loading up a 5G network to test on the moon comes Lady Rocket, Copernic Space, and Grand Blaisdell. We are now in a position to deliver $30 million in revenues to them using our capabilities to create space asset. And what is their space asset? Empty air inside of the lunar rover because they, they have empty space. So we are monetizing their space, uh, empty space through so-called NFTs to whom? They are private people who want to buy privilege of sending something to the moon. There are big brands. I think someone mentioned brands and corporations. Uh, 
And so here's, here's the solution that we want to popularize because the biggest innovation has to happen in the way that people like you and others and the young generation gets funded. We cannot rely on that. And I was actually invited by the White House to meet with Kamala Harris as a chief, uh, wow. chief of our... Yeah. Uh, but for the interesting subject that, like your research, is not very easily fundable, American government, all of us, have a problem of a space debris, which you cannot easily finance cleanup of the space. So we are looking into using our platform to let us Americans acquire NFTs with the purpose of helping to clean up the space. So I don't want to take up more time, but just wanted to highlight that look toward uh, people like us and others to stand by and be eager, willing, and most importantly, able to find a ways to, to support uh, scientific research. So, uh, and you can take a look at um, our website and we are issuing NFTs. And, and listen, one beautiful thing that I want to share with you, it tells a story of generosity of American society, and I am sure also of other societies. You mentioned going to the moon, and this this was also the, the time when I raised my hand. So the biggest marketing problem that NASA had in managing Apollo 11 mission, and I know it from the people who were in charge of marketing, was guess what? Millions of dollars that Americans, without being asked, were sending to NASA in a little envelopes because it was, what, 68, 69? So they were swamped by thousands and thousands of envelopes with five, 10, 20, 50, $100 because Americans were saying, here it is, go for it. We are so proud. We want to contribute. So Copernic Space is now using existing technology, blockchain, NFTs, uh, smart contracts, smart contracts, which by the way, for scientists is brilliant way to capture your scientific scientific discoveries in a commercial sense without having to wait for the patent. So that's uh, that's the energy that is coming from from my place. And by the way, I am a third generation space, aerospace and space um, family. My father, even un under Soviet domination, was able to launch an astronaut and space program in, in Poland, who wasn't free at that time. So I have my personal wow. commitment to to seeing us through and making a humble contribution uh, and making young people because you see young people like nfts young people like crypto young people love blockchain so if they can give us the project we can transform it into the asset and then people will decide if they want to finance so it's not on the government i see i see, I see. So, no, this is wonderful news actually wonderful yeah i I really appreciate what you're doing in order to connect to basic scientists as well. I mean, many, many companies do huge amounts of R&D, but very few of them actually bother to uh, actually seek out, you know, basic science communities and even participate or listen or say yes. it in there. So I think you are doing something very rare and very appreciable. I just had one question for you. Yes. Um, every once in a while, something like somebody like you for example the simon's foundation from uh, the wall street guy right simon yes there was an incident where there was a, a deficiency of funding for a basic science project uh -huh. that project was able to get funding from that foundation yes normally that project was funded by the standard government channels yes so it created a weird backlash in the sense that the government position was the following. We were cutting off the funding because we thought that was not a good science project to be funded. So when the project then went to private money like this, uh -huh. it actually sent the wrong signal to the government channel uh, as if you know, they were not playing ball anymore with their usual funding agency and, you know, they were going off on the side and getting private money and so on. So yes. it was in a way, rather than being a government-private 
partnership in funding the basic project basic science yes. project yes. it became like an adversarial territorial oh this was my territory why did you come here yes. kind of thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so this has created a bit of a scare every time somebody like me says should i go out and look for private funding i keep thinking well oh but but what will happen to my government grant then will it disappear will yes it disappear because that's a very pragmatic uh, so what... important important consideration and i totally yeah. understand now let me tell you the difference between what we give and foundation with all due respect to foundation i look at the funding as a dead money and i was entrepreneur i had a research development projects under me I was never attracted to the foundation. Time it takes, paperwork, and, all the, and it doesn't give energy, it just gives a flow, cash flow temporarily. What we do, and this is what I mentioned, we provide revenues, which is the best form of funding. Revenues ahead of the project getting done. That's the innovation because the Lunar Outpost can now start getting funding through our NFTs on the anticipation that they, NASA, SpaceX, are going to land on the moon and everything is going to be fine. But because of the nature of smart contract and NFT, this is not uh, you know, punishing relationship with the foundation or, or investor or even government where you have to deliver by a certain schedule. No, NFTs are children of love, compassion, excitement, risk taking, it's a completely different mechanism. So, but I hear you and this is the problem that that need, it's, I guess, case by case basis. Uh, but the only reason that I'm taking time of the entire team and, and uh, Katerina is to make the point that f- seek new financial uh, alignments. Another very interesting place of potentially private funding is what we call crypto whales or Bitcoin whales. Those are the guys, some of them are billionaires, some of them have a hundred million dollars sitting on fortunes that they made, despite of the fact that that Bitcoin went down, there are still people who made tons of money and they are still happy. And they are getting, uh, they have an anxiety and they're getting anxious because they are people of risk taking, vision, trying to change the world. And they are getting anxious to put their Bitcoin to work for something uh, worth taking risk, worth taking risk for I another see. moonshot. I see. So, so consider different sources. So let me finish here. I don't want to take up more time of this very fun <coughs> room. But thank you for letting me share, and I hopefully contribute something worth thank uh, thinking about. Thank you so much, and uh, Katerina, Pleasure. thank you for inviting me. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for uh, this discussion. I don't know, Naz and Rajashi, they joined. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much time or patience you Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Hi, Katerina. Hi, Serena. Uh, Ash, Ashatosh? Ashatosh, yes, please, Ashatosh. go ahead. Uh, Lady Rocket, I have a question for you about space assets. How do you price it? How do you monetize it? And what is the intrinsic value of it? Yes, uh, yes, sorry, I, I, well, I am listening, but I am working on my to the moon presentation. Oh, okay, sorry. But here is the you answer. You don't have to answer. No, no, no. Uh... No, I want to answer. I want to answer. I was just, you know, p- putting some things on the PowerPoint. So this, this is excellent, excellent uh, uh, question. So in a specific case that is described, it's public information, it's endorsed by NASA, etc. Here is where the pricing came from. Copernic Space, my company, is a marketplace. It's more like an eBay for 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 uh, for uh, uh, space ventures. Price is established by our client Lunar Outpost. Their price, however, is being regulated and influenced by NASA. So. The result is as follows, not very happy for me personally, because the NFTs that allow you to acquire place inside of the lunar outpost in a digital sense is very cheap. 
you can send a digital uh, asset to the moon for four thousand dollars to send physical uh, artifact to the moon the price starts at around four hundred twenty thousand dollars for 10 decagrams those are not prices established by us lunar outposts tell us uh, do it this is the price and this is how we are going to allocate what again what are they allocating physical space inside of the lunar rover slash spacex and the computer because on the computer we are going to put digital digital data what digital data music poetry art science because we want to make moon much more exciting place than it has been uh, given a chance to be so far so we are a marketplace so we do not regulate it the marketplace will regulate itself people will buy or not we have a great interest and we are formally launching in london shortly in a in a financial district so anyway did i answer the question or you you had uh, no that's quite all right thank you Yes, so and we are negotiating right now with some other spectacular visionary companies because it takes visionary. But we look at people like Richard Branson, empty space in his staff. Uh, the, the Bezos, empty, he just, you know, gets a couple of billionaires in, but he can do much more. Uh, but bottom line, we are not doing it for the commerce. We are doing it to democratize and create space economy for all of us no commerce democratization and creation of the space economy thank you uh, i have a question for Tosh, if it's all right um it's a bit philosophical about um the measurement problem and um i i guess i would like to ask uh is it possible that we need to revise uh, heisenberg's authority principle to have a more generalized um something that applies that are possibly smaller than the Planck length scale. Um, and is the, I, I think uh, the, you're, you're, the, you're in the best position to answer this as you're an experimentalist in high precision measurement. So um, is, is it possible that we may one day revise it or have a, have a new version or a more different formula? My, my guess is the answer is yes. And my second guess is that for all said and done about string theory, the answer is already in string theory, at least. Maybe in other theories as well. But I'm guessing string theory has already revised the basic quantum mechanics, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So it's possible in the theoretical sense, I believe, yes, because string theory has already done it. And the reason I'm saying this is that the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics is only following the axioms of quantum without incorporating gravity. I, one of the big motivations of string theory is in fact, that it's one of the very few theories that actually does successfully incorporate gravity and quantum mechanics into a single theory. So gravity and quantum do not naturally or easily combine because their axioms are at conflict with each other. And you can easily understand this. But string theory manages to pull them together and actually be a self-consistent quantum theory of gravity. And as soon as you have that, you can't only have the quantum principle, right? You have the gravity principles and it, you know, string theory does what it does and pulls it all together. So in there, in string theory, I bet this sort of typical pure quantum uncertainty principle has already been modified into something that's compatible with gravity. So string theory lives at the Planck scale. So you know whatever quantum physics happens at the Planck scale, it will necessarily change the uncertainty principle as stated into something else so i think in that sense the answer to your question is yes it's it's possible and it's been done whether that's the right answer we don't know because for that we need data right answer only means consistent with data and we don't have data 
but theoretically it is possible has been done so um can i just ask you um i mean so far our basis of measurement is usually electromagnetic radiations which obviously are going to fall prey to a minimum resolution of the planck length um uh, and therefore heisenberg's uncertainty principle will probably hold true for these kinds of measurements but um what what other measurements what are the ways of measurement could we um undertake in high precision measurement which might not be limited to the planck scale you you mean that would go smaller than the planck scale yes or more precise than uh, the uncertainty principle would allow for Oh, smaller than the Planck length. I'm trying to imagine where we are ever going to find an experimental situation that's anywhere close to the Planck length. So in that sense, um, I mean, I mean, you said philosophical, yeah. How about like um, the gravitational field? Um, caused by a single micro uh, like a particle moving in a in a volume like the change in gravitational field caused by it something like that might potentially be smaller than the planck scale right the gradient yeah but how do you measure how do you measure anything how do you get that experiment to be that close that's the thing right to measure something you have to get an experimental sensor close enough so that your planck scale physics is detectable in other words you have to get your sensor and your um, system close enough in distance which is a planck scale distance uh, right um uh, i mean we do some like we use phase in um at ligo i i did uh, laser interferometers and i, I yeah. mean, phase is um a good way of like i think phase could be potentially something that um is is a smaller measure of distance or width or or length than the planck scale because potentially we could like measure a um, a small offset in phase that is that is um more accurate than our measurement of distance um without having to you know have physical proximity um as much because we're just detecting the phase of interfered lasers and I, i'm just like throwing it out there but yeah yeah i see what you mean my worry is that when you get to the anywhere close to the planck scale when you say the phase measurement of ligo you know why the phase measurement of ligo works it works because the coherence of the laser is maintained over the hundreds of kilometers that the laser is bouncing back and forth right so the the laser is a quantum state that can maintain its coherence over a very long distance whatever distance it can maintain that coherence at the phase is is a measurable quantity that's coherent over that length i am worried that you, you can't maintain that kind of phase coherence of a quantum system in the planck regime so it doesn't extrapolate that the phase coherence doesn't extrapolate into the planck regime okay right so um, i don't know this but i'm i'm guessing that's where the argument breaks down um so i, I agree i mean uh, the, i mean uh, um separating from the thermodynamic noise of the environment would be the biggest problem um and but if you were theoretically able to do that and not have and have like an isolated environment like something like a faraday cage but um removing all um anything that could interfere fine i'm i'm not even saying that the phase gets decohered by thermal noise suppose you have an absolute zero somewhere right um see what you're talking about is measuring the displacement of two objects that are far apart by a very small amount that's not the same thing as getting the two objects to within a planck length of each other uh um what you're saying is if if i have two objects you know 20 kilometers away from each other and i'm bouncing a laser back and forth and now if one of those objects gets displaced by one planck length will i be able to sense that displacement 
yeah, maybe in principle with zero temperature laser out in space, maybe. But that's not killing, giving you access to Planck length physics just because you can measure a displacement of one Planck's length. I think. Right. Uh, yeah, to measure sense. Planck length physics, you have to get the objects close to each other by of this order of one Planck length. Uh, yeah, I think the only places where we might encounter matter exotic enough to be closer than a Planck length would be like, what are those blue stars or dwarf stars uh, or, or neutron stars? But um, I, I mean, it's it's quite... Uh, no. um, Neutron star doesn't do it. Uh, so maybe uh, there was one celestial object. I forgot which one. Um, maybe a quasar, which had uh, really high, um, the, the um, higher generation, higher tier quarks and all are found in the core, etc. But um, I, I think... Uh, that's still um, that's still 10 orders of magnitude away from the Planck length, right? Uh, right. But for example, suppose we have like a black box, which is... Uh, thermal isolator, etc., and you have a laser um, inside, and there's just one single particle moving around in there. Could we potentially um, detect um, that the movement of that particle at like half a Planck length? Um, is is I think my question. The particle is moving around in a box, and what happens? It it comes to within one Planck length of. Um, say there's a laser which is. Um, um, you know, uh, and and the lasers, uh, based on uh, the particles passing through the beam, were able to detect um, um, its position at, at time at an accuracy. I mean, we're able to tell every time it moves a half Planck distance. Is is uh, the hypothesis I'm trying to ask about? Because it's interfering with the laser, we can tell when it's moved half a Planck distance. Not, not at the energy of the laser that you have, because the laser is still a macroscopic thing, right? The laser is not a Planck length device. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so the laser still obeys standard Hansen principle. So, in order to tell a distance of half Planck length, it would need a you would need a ten to the nineteen GeV laser. Which is the same thing as saying you need a collider of 10 to the 19 GV to be able to probe a distance of half a Planck length. Because the laser is still obeying standard quantum. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Is, is there ways to like um, uh, use, uh, I mean, instead of, um, I mean, you have to worry about it in interfering in, in the direction of the transversity of the wave, right? Because it's a transverse electromagnetic wave. But uh, if you would use a longitudinal wave instead um, as a means of detection, in that case, uh, we don't have the same same problems of how the collisions happen and uh, the transfer of energy between the wave and the particle that's uh, interfering. So in the quantum description, a longitudinal wave is always a wave associated with a massive quantum particle, right? So longitudinal wave when quantized means that the quanta are massive. So I think you, in order to make the wave sufficiently longitudinal, it effectively means you're trying to make your probe particle a massive particle as opposed to a massless photon. So the but, but, wave is transverse because the photon is massless. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. But what about, for example, an acoustic sound wave is, a, uh, is longitudinal, right? But massless? I don't... So acoustic sound wave... Is it massless? I have to think about it. Let me, we can, we can separately, you can find out my phone number. We can talk separately. I'm sorry. I have to think about whether a sound wave is massless truly or not. 
Uh, because um, it's it, the it it causes uh, perturbations in the medium, right? The medium itself has mass, but um, the sound <laughs> wave. Yeah. So now you're basically moving massive medium, which is a lot the of medium noise, has yeah. to be massive because the medium is at rest. So the medium has to be massive. So you're 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 kind of moving massive things around and calling it a massless wave. I. <laughs> Fine, you can call it a massless wave, but those massive things are not Planck length things. Absolutely, I I, I just have this uh, this uh, very uh, sorry this very pretty picture in my head of a giant ball of mercury and uh, being able to do really high resolution detection inside the center of it, just because. Um, you know, um, it's isolating all the noise and moving predictably, at least statistically. But uh, I th thanks. For, I'm sorry. Thanks for taking all my questions, and it was really, okay. really nice talking okay. to you. Okay. You you know the problem with your medium logic, right? Your wavelength will never get smaller than the distance between the atoms of your medium. So you, eventually your wavelength will be limited to something way, way, way bigger than the Planck length. It will be limited by the minimum distance between your massive medium objects. That's the problem with using a medium to do this, to create a longitudinal wave. <laughs> its wavelength can never be larger, it can never be smaller than so, um... the, the, the size of your medium things, your atoms or protons or whatever. Yeah, that's, um, if you try to pass a, a transverse wave through it, then absolutely it would have to like, you know, um, electron drift and not just electron drift, collisions. But um, I mean, if, if you're talking about an, an acoustic wave, which is a matter wave, right? Um, it's it's actually just moving the atoms around. Yeah. If, if, for example, you're just detecting the thermal energy, um, like from the mercury atoms hitting each other, um, you get a very accurate idea of how much something inside is moving just by measuring how much thermal energy is coming from the entire ball of matter. Um, and, and but uh, I'm sorry, it seems like a tangent. But yeah, I agree with you. If you're trying to detect something by sending a transverse wave through a medium, then certainly the uh, the uh, the it would be limited in resolution, right? By the uh, distance between them. But the trans the longitude are also. The longitudinal will also be limited. But um, the wavelength will never get smaller than the interatomic distance. Even uh, no, actually, it would it would just um, it would just push through sort of, and maybe the amplitude would be reduced, but it would be able to go through it regardless of what the size of the medium is. Only um, it's like pushing a, a group a set of balls that are lined up, right? You push the backward ball. And, of, and yeah. they all push each other and reach out the front. Yeah, but the wavelength of that pushing wave is more than the distance between the atoms. Is huge, yeah, usually. Yeah, but you want to make it small, right? You want to make it Planck length. Um, I mean, okay. You, we, I mean, we want to make it Planck length in the case of a transverse wave to, so that... Um, we can, I mean, it. it uh, we would want it to be Planck length if it's less than a transverse wave so that we would be able to detect, detect it. Um, but um, if, if, we're, if we're equating it to something else, for example, uh, the thermal uh, th uh, heat generated by the movement of that particle by colliding with the surrounding medium, mm -hmm. um, in that scenario, we don't have to worry about resolution of the wave of a detector wave, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, so it, it's like, uh, because we've equated to another parameter, we're not actually uh, detecting its path per se. Uh, so much okay. so as we're detecting um, its resultant action on other things. So um, the, the, the limit of resolution would instead be like, uh, how, how accurately can we measure temperature, for example? Well, I keep going uh, back to, is any one of your atoms able to detect a Planck length displacement next to it? I, the atomic size is so far bigger than the Planck length. I'm not sure there is any 
you can compute the gravitational difference. What's the force on the atom from something close to it? And if that thing moves by half a Planck length, how much will the gravitational force on that atom change? So uh, I think maybe just accentuate the point. Uh, you consider a, la a very uniform lattice, a highly uniform lattice. So even a small movement within that lattice would result in sort of um, scaled up uh, effects, right? That, that are possibly de de detected elsewhere in the lattice. No, um, because so the lattice always has zero point energy. There's no such thing as a static lattice. Right. And it always has zero point energy. Even at zero temperature, it has zero point energy. Uh, hi, uh, Rajeshi. And uh, yeah, so I um, really you know, appreciate uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, persistent pursuit of uh, you know, the, the, the Planck length uh, scale of uh, measurement. And uh, also thanks, doctor, for very, uh, very uh, accommodating you know, the uh, yeah, sure. A way of, you know, this uh, general audience of uh, science society, but uh, I do wanted to. Uh, 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 I uh, I have uh, also uh, among this uh, uh, line. Maybe we can summarize a little bit for the benefit of the uh, audience of this particular question. Uh, from my general uh, uh, understanding of uh, the plank plank scale, they just like uh, doctor said that you need. Uh, uh, orders of m m magnitude more of energy uh, of what is available right now at a CERN, the maximum. So for the participation of more audience, uh, Rajeshi, if you can, uh, so so I don't think phonon would uh, be a good candidate because just like uh, Dr. mentioned that the, the phonon is uh, uh, way, way lower, right? So it's uh, also, when when you say it's a, a massless phonon, a mass massless uh, a boson, it's uh, it's uh, quite a different thing there because it's a, it's a, it's excitation mode, right? So it's just like the uh, doctor mentioned, it's a massive crystal that you rely on. There, it's if you uh, uh, consider more higher order corrections. It's you know say for example uh, back react you know no. anyway so I think there's uh, proposals for you know this uh, if you can do that at a Planck scale then the quantum gravity community would all come to you right so the <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a right assessment but I do given the availability of uh, uh, your time uh, doctor that uh, from a previous so now we are taking advantage of your presence at a precious time, turning it into a learning <laughs> class. So if I may, I, let me just uh, chip in with one of my questions, maybe related to what Rajeshi's uh, uh, curiosity as well, just joining the uh, circle in the, the chime. The um, earlier, uh, Eli asked the question on the um, the wave function, is it? Is it for for experimental community of of, of your yours the uh, I did some Google as well. Of, uh, is it uh, uh, treated as a a uh, observable operator or just a parameter? So for for the for for, for the mass in, in this scenario, because from if I you know understood sub thirty percent of uh, the earlier discussion between. Um, you're answering uh, Eli's question. Is that a, a, a valid uh, uh, a question, or what, what's your per take on? Uh, uh, can you say again what it is you're asking about being an observable so the, quantity? The, the MW, the mass of uh, 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 W boson. So, so you should, if it's a free particle, observable. so the mass would be. So is it observable with a wave function, or is there a per parameter that you you you're looking at it? It's a parameter. It's not an observable with a wave function. No. I see. So, how, but what if? Uh, so it, it will be different for a a a, a particle that has uh, internal structures, right? So then it will be a different story. Um. 
in a sense, you're asking me, what is the meaning of mass? Uh, sort of, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. yeah. What does the mass of anything mean? So, I know that's uh, probably a hard question and uh, very, uh, uh, I'm yeah, be happy to, to. Mass and special relativity is E square, energy square is equal to momentum square plus mass square. Like that's the definition of mass. So the, the, let me put it this way. Let's go back to the longitudinal thing in the previous conversation, right? So what happens when an electromagnetic wave goes through a waveguide? Which means it's bouncing back and forth. So it's moving from left to right. So the EM wave is moving from left to right. The EM wave has some energy. Now, what is the momentum it has if the wave is also moving exactly left to right, then it appears as the typical massless EM wave because all of its momentum is moving in the same direction as the energy is moving. So energy and momentum are pointing in the same direction. All of the momentum is equal to the energy and there is no mass. So E squared is equal to P squared and M is zero. So now you take this wave and make it point a little bit up. So now on the waveguide, it's bouncing back and forth. You see what I mean? It's going slightly upwards and to the right. It bounces on the top, comes down, then bounces on the lower surface, bounces up again. So now you can see that the momentum component in the horizontal direction, left to right, is lower than before. The total momentum is still equal to the energy but the energy transport is happening horizontally, the horizontal component of the momentum is not equal to the total energy because there is a component of the momentum pointing up and down, correct? So E will now be bigger than P. So this wave appears to be massive and it moves slower than the speed of light as a result, which is true because it's following a zigzag path, its horizontal speed is less than the speed of light. Simple trigonometry. So uh, an electromagnetic massless wave moving through a waveguide looks like it has a longitudinal component, looks like it has a mass-like property because it's moving lower than the speed of light which by special relativity means it is massive. Can I, so, um, is it accurate to say that um, uh, you can describe mass as the degree of localization of anything, how localized it is to one point? Sort of. It's, in a sense, if, yeah, I, I can take my waveguide logic further and answer the question. If you take a microwave cavity and you have an electromagnetic wave just bouncing back and forth within that cavity, so it has no net momentum, it just sits there at rest. How would you describe the energy which is trapped in the cavity? There's a certain amount of energy bouncing back and forth in the cavity, but it doesn't have any momentum. So that energy now appears like a mass. If you go far away, that energy is without momentum is going to appear exactly like a mass. So localized energy without momentum is what mass really means. Right? So, so this basically a standing wave. It's like a standing wave um, pattern of an electromagnetic wave is basically you mean, yes, you localize the EM wave so that all of its energy now appears like a mass. It's not moving at the speed of light because it's going nowhere. 
and microscopically you can see okay now it's bouncing left now it's bouncing right but macroscopically it's going nowhere so that's energy without momentum if that's what we mean by localization so so now how do you now you say what's the wave function how would you describe the wave function of this wave yeah, its wave function has the property of a stationary particle, which is a massive particle. That's what mass is. So the MW is the same thing. There's a way to visualize the, the field that's propagating. It, it's as if it is trapped in a cavity to some extent. And what is making the cavity is the Higgs field. So this thing is bouncing off the Higgs field back and forth. So in a sense, the, the, the Higgs field all over the place is localizing it. And so some part of the energy shows up as the mass, as the mass property. Is the, in trapping, that sense, um, is the trapping mechanism it, is by charge? Since, since photon has no, uh, cannot be trapped in this way. Say again? So it, you mentioned the trapping uh, 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 picture. Yes. So is it because of due to the charge of W boson and uh, other? I mean, otherwise photon will be trapped as well, right? Yes. So the trap is built with the Higgs field, which has no electric charge. That is why the, it doesn't trap the photon. So the photon remains massless. It's engineer. I mean, it's designed. The <laughs> The theory is designed to do exactly what you want, which is postulate a Higgs field with zero charge, zero electric charge, so it cannot trap the photon. But it does have a charge. It has the charge of the weak interaction. It has the other charge, which the W boson has. So it's because of that charge that the W boson gets trapped, but the photon does not. Yeah, thank you. Right, so what what it traps and what it doesn't trap is exactly defined by which charge the Higgs has and which charge it doesn't have. And it's engineered to do what you need it to do, which is don't trap the photon, but trap the W. So you see what I mean by, by what the mass ref is reflecting? It's reflecting the kinematic property of the wave function. It's not a wave function itself. It's reflecting the, it's reflecting the energy momentum properties of the particular wave function we're talking about. And that's true for every massive object. That electron, whatever it is, has a wave function. That wave function has some energy and momentum and the mass is defining the particular relationship between the energy and the momentum. Thank you. I think that's uh, that helps a lot. <laughs> it saved me uh, uh, many hours of uh, kind of uh, uh, plowing through the textbooks. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Okay. So, so yeah. in, in that way, so maybe I can just uh, pick it up the one of the slides you mentioned. The uh, so as 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 what you do is treating mass as a parameter is because it is actually a trapped in a cavity that is the, uh, the eigenvalues of the energy in a, in a way that uh, it becomes a parameter. Is that the... It's correct? rather than the eigenvalue of the energy, it's more like it's the eigenvalue of energy square minus momentum square. Oh, yeah. It's E square minus P square. P is the momentum, E is the energy. So E square minus P square is equal to M square. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Rajeshi, sorry, so the sorry. Energy need, not, the energy need not have a specific eigenvalue. The momentum need not have a specific eigenvalue. But the operator here is E square minus P square. Great, and that helps a lot. Uh, Katerina, yeah, uh, uh, Matt, m m back to you uh, for the mic. Oh, thank you. My my question is probably completely nonsense, but um, so I'll. It's late, so 
please excuse me but my ignorance um so what could um some interaction with dark matter somehow contribute to this difference of the weight that you know you found out versus what the standard model predicts or would that be yes. far-fetched no i think that can certainly be one explanation so it can certainly be one explanation so if the dark matter is interacting with the w somehow and one can make a theory for that then it can induce through the quantum fluctuations it can induce the kind of shift we are seeing yes that would be very exciting wouldn't it <laughs> um how yes. would how would we see that like can we pull it down you know for proteins we can pull them down <laughs> well what this would mean is for example at the lhc since we can definitely produce the w bosons and w if the w bosons are, are interacting with dark matter that means as a secondary reaction the proton anti proton 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 collide to create w plus whatever now the dark matter can be radiated off the w so this means that at the lhc w production is a way to produce dark matter so why are the w so this would imply that dark matter is being created at the lhc with one caveat the mass of the dark matter particles should be small enough that the lhc can actually produce them right? see in the vacuum quantum fluctuations you are just borrowing energy as much as you need to create the dark matter particle and then it disappears so you are not short of energy in that sense for the quantum version of it but to actually make the dark matter particles of the let's see it the process must happen as long as the dark matter particles are not too heavy so there is hope that one can see the dark matter particles somehow <laughs> it's all about you can't directly detect the dark matter particles so what are you going to see as a result you're going to see nature that is going to be interpreted as dark matter production that's a different topic but given such a signature can be calculated from that theory what would have to look for that signature and if everything fits we would say that looks like dark matter particles being produced so what would the property be so that it kind of a connector between our matter and dark matter that would that basically be how you know it all sticks together in the end in the universe our matter yes. and the dark matter would be kind of the glue the sticky part that yes wow that's, that's so exciting question. <laughs> excellent question so there are lots of ideas about what connects our matter with the dark matter most people thinks there is some connection because otherwise the amount of dark matter in the universe and the amount of actual matter in the visible matter in the universe that ratio is about 1 to 5 and 1 to 5 is not accidental the reason is 1 to 5 is because there's a reaction that connects them otherwise it could have been completely random so what kind of reaction it could be a reaction mediated by the higgs it could be a reaction mediated by the w's uh, we don't know of any other forces but then you could also postulate that there is yet another force in nature that we haven't yet discovered and it's that force that mediates the interaction between our matter and dark matter um, so there's a range of possibilities to to mediate between our visible sector and the dark sector new force or the w itself or the higgs 
So the Higgs is the most popular because we've already found the Higgs. So it's, it's more efficient to use an existing mediator than sort of invent a new one. And so, so these are called Higgs portal models. Portal means it's a door. So the Higgs goes through the door and it interacts with the dark matter and also interacts with us. So Higgs portal models, I would say, are the most popular. New inventing a new force to be the mediator is possible. It's a little less popular just philosophically because you haven't found the new force yet. So why not start with something you already found, like the Higgs? So these are the ideas, possible interactions between the dark sector and us. And if the W is involved in that interaction, then clearly you could make the W mass be different because of the dark matter interaction specifically. So it's possible. So could the, you know, the dark force or could it make it seem to be heavier than it actually is? Like, is there, is there a way, I don't know. I could, so because you said in theory, dark matter couldn't be as heavy as the difference, if I understand it right, then, um, you know, the difference in weight that the standard model uh, predicts. So could this make it, this interaction, just the interaction make it seem heavier than it would be by itself, dark matter by itself somehow? In a way, yes. See, when you have a physical observable effect, it depends on a number of things. Right? It depends on the mass of the new particles. It also depends on the strength of the interaction between that particle and us. So, so consider the two situations. You have heavy dark matter, but it has a large interaction strength. So you get a particular observable effect. You can get the same observable effect by having the dark matter being not as heavy, but at the same time, its interaction strength is also small. So, so it's, the, it's the combination of how strongly it interacts with us and how heavy it is. Two things can conspire. And since you don't know either one of them, what you're saying is possible, yes. So if the dark matter is very light, which sounds easy, great, but its interaction strength is also small, then the probability of interacting with the dark matter is reduced. So even though it's light and easy to make, it's a low probability process, which is not so good. But because it's one to five, doesn't, I mean, if it would be one to one, but if it's one to five, doesn't it increase the probability of having maybe more than one dark matter particle interacting with one W? Yes. You could have multiple dark matter particle types. There doesn't have to be just one dark matter particle. Could be more. So that will increase the probability of interacting with the W. Yes, I agree. That's a good thing. But that the strength of the interaction may still be small. So five times as many particles to choose from is a good thing. But if each of them interacts very weakly, then five times that is still a small number. So that's the flexibility you have in what nature might be doing. Maybe lots of particles there, but all of them interact so weakly that each of them induces a small effect. I see. And can it be just a fluent process like kiss and drop off like constantly? Like we say that to vesicle, um, uh, when vesicles kind of um, interact with membranes, um, so they kind of 
constantly it's a constant flow basically that's kind of like a membrane passing along and passing along and passing along yeah that so it's so fast that we cannot really we don't measure the intervals we just measure it looks like a constant interaction but in reality it's like a lot of very high frequency interactions that we cannot like a movie you know we cannot see the the signal yes, yes. so the the effects of the quantum fluctuation this quantum form i was describing the effects of those are exactly like you say you cannot observe the individual quantum fluctuations it's explicitly not possible by the rules but you only see the average effect of all the fluctuations so something like the mass of the w boson being shifted is exactly the average of all the individual fluctuations you cannot see any one fluctuation but you can see the average effect over a long time that's exactly the same analogy the direct detection at lhc for example is not like that you have to actually see a single collision producing the particles you're interested in you have to spot one instance at a time so what we call direct observation is literally the analog of your individual interactions being observed they're very fast and rare but direct observation means you've actually spotted individual events not just the average effect thank you and frank just reminded me we are almost up to the limit of the recording if we don't close the room okay. the recording of the room i'm so sad this was this is so fascinating and Wonderful. i'm really okay. thankful for you coming here and teaching us so much today i think i learned more than, than in years so uh and <laughs> i speak for other people too here so maybe you'll come back one day and and okay You'll teach us some more one day when you have patience for us again. <laughs> fine, fine, sure. Same, Happy to same do it. here. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, great appreciation for your. Ho hopefully, you will come back for the second lecture. By the way, this is okay. quickly. The, you haven't uh, had the time to touch on the even bigger mystery of dark energy yet. So, so it seems that dark matter already a uh, headache. So, dark energy will be even far fetched. W bosons, right? So, but maybe you know, next uh, yeah. uh, 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 sequel. <laughs> yeah, sequel. I can make a quick statement now that dark matter has a lot of candidate theories like the standard model, basically, extensions of the standard model, where you include some additional particle or particles, uh, maybe one or two more forces, maybe not even that. So you're still working within the framework of quantum mechanics, special relativity, ma other mathematics, just extending the content. The rules are the same, but the content, like more ingredients added to this recipe and it becomes a bigger recipe, but otherwise the cooking rules are the same. That's dark matter. Dark energy all essentially doesn't even fit. It does not fit within the rules of this quantum field theory framework. So, so dark energy is completely on a different level of understanding because this entire mathematical framework, which can easily describe dark matter, doesn't even come close to describing dark energy. So dark energy is even, in that sense, far harder to understand at a basic level. Yeah, I mean, endless frontier so that's uh you know kind of a for an engineer you know a very envy of uh, <laughs> scientists but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. for it's you fun. yeah really really uh i mean i mean you're so energetic and uh, you know also uh, open-minded to giving you know uh general audience a treat like today yeah, yeah really appreciate it and uh yeah in, nice. in respect of your time and uh also the yeah I mean, I'll uh, give the mic back to Katarina to maybe close or last word yeah, or sure. whatever. Katarina, do you, do you 
Mike's turn. Yes, thank you. I can only okay. thank you again. And uh, we really appreciate it. I think this was a historic clubhouse room. Okay. <laughs> I also want to thank you as well. It was fascinating. Oh, what are we over four hours? So, um, yeah. Just fascinating as range. I, as I said right in the beginning, if, if you get somebody doing research to talk about their research, then it's hard to get them to stop. The problem is not. <laughs> well, we, we really don't want to stop. stop. So hopefully you'll come back one day and we'll coordinate. Okay. And we really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your night and Frank, the Thank you. your day and um, wherever you are. And um, thank you so much. We, I can say, okay. how much. and appreciate it. I should thank you and the audience as well, right? You guys, some of you are sitting up at one twenty at night, so you have to appreciate the audience. Yeah. It's yeah. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you later. Yes. Thank you. Uh, bye. Bye, everyone. You. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So bye, much. everyone. Close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone.